Okay, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order at 9.03. And first up, I will go ahead and take attendance. Let's see, I am here. Kate Segroy. Here. Uh, let's see, Pam Sloan. Here. Roland Stallworth. Here. Uh, let's see, Todd Hess is traveling. Reggie Farmer. Not seen him yet. Cy Frederick. Here. Tammy Habig. Here. Ryan Sims. Here. Joe Wood is also traveling. Uh, Timothy Jackson. Here. Donnie Nelson. Here. Um, Paul Anderson is also traveling. And Ms. Tia Wonder. Uh, I know she's here. Okay, um, next up is public comment. Um, this time provides an opportunity for citizens to address the committee about any matter not on the agenda. Items raised during this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon. Should a member of the public wish to speak on a matter not listed on the agenda, it is asked that said person play please complete a blue comment card and submit it to the chair prior to the opening of the item. A limit of three minutes per person and or five minutes for a spokesperson of a particular group may be imposed. It is requested that comments be directed to the committee as a whole. Comments that are determined to be irrelevant, repetitious, offensive, inflammatory, willfully disruptive, or deemed to be personal attacks will not be permitted. I did get one email um, from Mr. Thomas Reimer, the athletic director at Carson High School, that I will go ahead and read. Um, I would like to draw attention to specific points within the packet that I believe require further discussion. Firstly, concerning the one-time transfer rule outlined on page 10, section 2B, it states that a student who transfers into a new school after the beginning of the school year is deemed ineligible. Given that school start dates can vary across districts in Nevada and neighboring states, this rule may need to be clear, may need clarification for consistency. Additionally, on page 17, NAC 385B.716 state that a pupil's name appearing on a roster of the association within the previous 180 school days can impact eligibility. There have been instances where students who were initially listed on a team roster but did not participate due to injury, were still considered on the roster. I believe it would be beneficial to discuss a potential appeal process for such cases, and I'm prepared to provide detailed examples if necessary. Regarding page 23, NAC 385B.744 mentions a form approved by the executive director. I would like to inquire whether this form will be made available on the association's website or if it is more will be more prominently featured on the Activate site. Lastly, on page 24, NAC 385B.824, I would like to suggest that the committee consider establishing an appeal process for coaches who are seeking to ensure the safety of students under their supervision. I appreciate your attention to these matters and look forward to discussing them further with you if desired. Thank you for your time and consideration. That is the only email I have. Um, Mr. Allison, is anybody here to give public comment in person? Thank you, Ms. Lotz. No, nobody in attendance here in the office. Okay. I, do any of you have somebody in your office that would like to make public comment? Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and move on. Next is the approval of the agenda today. Um, we just need a motion. I move to approve the agenda uh, for April 9th, 2024, for the meeting agenda. This is Pam, I'll second. Okay, is there any further discussion? Okay, so we have a motion to approve. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Lori, on. Spelling of my last name is is just with a single M. I I'm not offended and I don't mind, but for accuracy, it is one M. 
I apologize for, for that one. I will get that corrected. All good. Next is the approval of the minutes from the February 5th meetings. Um, after it was posted, I did notice one change that needed to be made. The title at the top says meeting notes, and it should actually say uh, meeting minutes. So if anyone would like to make a motion to approve with that change. This is Pam, I'll make a motion to approve with the edits as discussed instead of notes to read minutes and Ryan's name is corrected by by using one M, Sim. This is Rollins, I second. Okay, is there any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on to item six. <clears throat> six A, co-op programs. Uh, this is on the agenda mainly to kind of see if, is there any interest in pursuing this at any level? And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Nelson to kind of go through the history and um, the options here if we would like to move forward. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Lawson. and good morning, everybody. Thanks again for all your, your time and attention to a very important committee. So the co-op programs, I, my opinion, this is the time we need to decide whether or not we wanna move forward with such a regulation or take it off the agenda. Uh, part of me in, in thinking about this co-op is, you know, wh why wouldn't we wanna do this? Why wouldn't we wanna move forward with some kind of regulation that gives kids an opportunity to participate? But then you're right, you, you kind of circle back and what are, what are the pitfalls, catches of something like this? And then part of me says, maybe no, we shouldn't pursue this. And, and part of those reasons why maybe we shouldn't would be, do we run into a recruiting issue? Let, let's say we've got school A and school B that join together and school A or B ends up dropping the program. And then we've got the students who go, hey, our school just dropped the program for NACs. I'm allowed to go to another school. If they do that, is there inherent recruiting involved in that? Would there be discussion between two schools of we want students to come here for this particular sport. Now, again, I'm going way outside the box possibly on this, but, you know, it, it is an issue. Uh, another concern is how does transportation work? And I realize this is really a school and a school district matter. So the NIA could permit this for co-op programs and locally it would have to be figured out. You know, but but what about what about transportation for practices or for games? Uh, what about uniforms? What about equipment? How does that get shared? Yet we circle back to, again, you know, this came forward from the superintendent of the Eastern Sierra Unified School District in Colville High School because they have enrollments that are dropping uh, per their grade levels. And they're worried about continuing to be able to offer programs and teams and opportunities for kids. So why, you know, you heard that the, if you remember back when Colville had contacted Smith Valley and said, can we play with you? Would you be interested in, you know, in joining teams? And at that point, I don't want to speak for Smith Valley. The, the answer was, you know. Not sure, uh, or maybe no. Don't don't really know, but I want to comment for them. So that's how co-ops came about. We we do have states. I don't know exactly how many states. It's less than fifty percent, but we do we do have states uh, around Section Seven Eight in the West and other parts of the country that do have something just like this. And so you see option A and option B. This is derived from those handful of states that do offer co-op programs. I would venture to guess in in speaking with colleagues about this at meetings across the country. It, we're probably somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 percent. So again, that's my, that's my best guess. I can do a full survey. I'm seeing every, all my colleagues here uh, starting tomorrow night with uh, with meetings. So I can ask that question if you want me to uh, across the board. But anyway, so you have option A. That was what I found to be the most comprehensive uh, option for a co-op program. Uh, option B, in my opinion, limits the scope and magnitude of schools and sports that are available for consideration. Uh, it's not that we can't match language in option B. To, uh, to within option A, but uh, th those are the two key options that I found. And certainly again, like I said, option B is more of 1A, 2A focused and, school and sports that are focused, whereas option A is kind of the broad based thing. So those are some of the positives of giving kids opportunities, some of the inherent possible negatives or pitfalls that could happen between schools and districts that have to work together if they do decide to do this. And again, if we, even if we do offer this regulation and create it, 
it doesn't mean that schools have to say yes. If they get asked by a neighbor school or a neighbor program coach, maybe a district policy says no. So there can be more restrictions to it. But uh, anyway, long story short, thank you, Ms. Loss, for letting me introduce this and turn it back over to you and the committee of do we want to move forward with this or not? That's where we are. Thank you. Question? Go ahead, Mr. Stoller. Thank you. Uh, Donnie and, 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 and Lori, from your office standpoint, since I don't, and, and Washoe County really doesn't see this that much, um, do you guys see this a lot? Is there, has there been one school or one region that's been more apt to say, hey, look, we need this um, uh, because I don't really experience this that th this much at all. So I don't know which option would be the best based on what has been the consistency from in your office of, of who's been doing this and what has been the result. Thank you, Ms. Lotz. I'll, I'll take that on if you don't mind, uh, Donnie Nelson okay. and staff. So uh, Mr. Stallworth, we've only had one request in our state and it came from Colville High School. Uh, I know other committee members here, and I'll refer to Ms. Habig here in a second, because I know she has made the comment in, in a board meeting. And I mean, to put you on the spot, Tammy, but you understand what I'm going with that. You know, right. We, we do have programs, varsity level, lower levels, individual based sports, team bracket sports that could potentially benefit from us. But to answer your question, uh, Mr. Stallworth, from the magnitude of it, the state of Nevada, I, I've only had an inquiry from one school. And that's why this is on here, because we had a superintendent asked to put this on the agenda for the board of control and we reverted it back to this committee first so that's all i have so in, in in the future if we don't act on this at all and in two years there's a, re a very similar request could the niaa make a decision based on not having a regulation or having um having this actually being, being approved by this committee um, to move forward? Could the NIAA at that particular time make a ruling on that particular case? Uh, thank you, Mr. Stallworth, for that great question. The answer is no. The okay. NIA office staff nor this committee could make any ruling on that because it would be uh, in direct violation of scrimmages and okay. schools getting together, right? You know, we, we have a special exemption. We've had one recently for girls wrestling for schools to be able to practice together just to try and build those programs. But otherwise, we've never granted uh, exceptions for schools to get together and practice together, let alone combine to compete together. So, so the answer would be no. It has to be an actual regulation for it to be considered. Okay, and then the situation that happened this year with Colville, I believe, the, the, the uh, how many kids were impacted by the decision not to let them play? Yeah, uh, so interesting, with Smith Valley also dropped its football program this year, and Colville's numbers and Smith Valley's football numbers dwindled to the point where they could not field the eight-person team. Uh, I want to say that Smith, and I'm just guessing here, I don't I don't have Dave, Dick obviously on here, but I think Smith Valley's numbers dipped to below double digits, so they were in single digits, which again, that wasn't feasible to, to play a football game with only eight players when you've got eight, eight on the field at a time. And Colville was right about the same situation, too. I, I believe they, they were dropping down to single-digit numbers. So we lost two teams at that level um, during that year. Yeah, and I'd have to double-check. Sorry, Mr. I'd have to double-check. I, I almost want to say Colville did find a way to finish their season. I have to go back and check in the standings. Okay. But but I think they did with, with at the very bare bones, if, if I recall correctly. But I'd have to double-check. Okay. Hey, hey, Donnie, this is Pam. If – well, if I'm looking at option B, have you had the conversation with the Class A and, and uh, the 1A, 2A representatives to see if they were even in favor in pursuing this? Uh, thank you, Ms. Sloan. No, we haven't done a, a full survey of our member schools, and it's because it has been just a consideration option for this committee to say, do we want to go forward and look, you know, and, and go forward with considering this to begin with? Uh, I don't want to necessarily speak directly for our, our 1A presidents. But uh, no, there has not been another 1A president that has come and said, let's let's go forward with this. Uh, you know, David Vick has really spoken for the group on a large degree, uh, and, and it has not been a, a push from anybody to do it outside of a superintendent from a, a member school district. Thank you. Yeah. And, and to Ms. Sloan's purpose, if, if this committee says let's go forward or let's survey, 
we could certainly do that, just, just to add that, but there hasn't been a need to do that at this point. I have a question on option A. When it says charter school and private school pupils may only be eligible at public school districts in sports, that basically, just so I'm clear, means that two of them could not combine if we did go forward. Uh, correct, correct, Ms. Hebig. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Donnie, just real quick, um, yes. wouldn't that then re require us to change regulation because it currently prohibits private school kids from playing at their uh, residentially zoned schools? So we're looking at a, a multi-step process here if we do move forward with this for regulation, correct? Yeah, that, good good point, Mr. Uh, Jackson. So I, I don't know how, it, I'd probably defer to Mr. Anderson in going forward if we have to change two regulations rather than just adding one regulation. Um, that that's a great. I think we'd have to work through that. Let's. I, I don't want to comment until without Mr. Anderson being present. But that's a that's a really good point. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm, it'd be. Oh God, go ahead, Tammy. I was just gonna say. I think it'd be a good idea to maybe poll people to see how they feel before we make any kind of recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, I was just gonna bring up the point of kind of going along what Tim said. If we did go with something like this, the first paragraph in option A. So we're saying, you know, you can play private or charter. We already have a regulation that says currently charter students can play at their, their zone school with no penalty, right? But then the third paragraph says, in any case of pupils from one school participating with pupils from another school, they'll not be eligible for postseason. So that would mean all of our current charter kids that are playing at their zone schools because their charter doesn't offer, none of those programs would be able to be postseason eligible if we went with language like that. Is that what I'm reading? Uh, Mr. Ray, that's that's correct. Yeah, and that's what to Mr. Jackson's point, it would probably take the addition of a new regulation such as this, but it would also take the amending, possibly, depending on what Mr. Anderson would say, possibly the amending of two other regulations. Right. Because I'm just thinking, I don't think our public schools down here would even want any of those kids on their team because they want to be able to play in postseason. So then, you know, are they cutting them for good reason or are they cutting them because they don't want them? To be a part of the program because they're out of postseason. So I think if we do go in any direction with this, we have to be very careful about what we add in there and how it impacts what we currently have going on. Yeah, and Mr. Gray, you're you're correct, and that's why I come back to there has not been a push or a recommendation or a favor from any other school or league except for one at this point, which again, a superintendent has the right to put something on our board agenda right. and for us to consider. So that that's why we're here, and that that's my question is. Do we want to go to step two and survey, or do we just want to shut it down and say, look, we don't, we don't know of any other interest? And we do have a policy, right? If, if, a, if a school or a principal or somebody wants to propose a change to a, to a regulation, we have a regulation submission form. Schools could do it. Hey, I want to propose this. We haven't received that. So we're still in this discussion, or I want to say more of a discovery phase of do we want to go forward or not? And again, at this point, until somebody we, – we could say no today and just end this. And then if some school or principal wants to write, propose a regulation change, they could do it. And then we could reconsider it at that level at that point. So we're kind of in this gray area where I don't know that we really need to go forward with this. It, it has some merit to do it. I just haven't heard any other flavor for it. That's all. Hey, Donnie, is, are the, uh, the 1A, 2A schools that are eligible to do so, are they, are they aware of this consideration? I'm just, you know, uh, trying to um, advocate for those who are unaware that this is being talked about. So in that case, maybe polling um, all those schools and seeing how the schools feel who have kids participating and how they would feel playing against a co-op team, um, you know, who might pose a, I guess, a threat in, in eliminating them. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sims. That's a great point. So again, if this committee wants to direct our office staff to create a, which would be a very simple survey, send it out to all schools. And I would caution that we would not just send it to 1A, 2A schools only, because we do know there's always a potential for 3A, 4A, or 5A school in individual-based or team-based sports, and even at lower levels, that they might not be able to field teams. And so they have everybody look at this. But again, if, that, if the committee's direction is to do a, a very simple survey, are, are you in favor of this? And we could put basically option A is what I would recommend in a survey out there. Yes or no. And we could get feedback from it. And uh, we, we could go that route if we wanted to. Thank you. I recommend at this particular time that we we, we let this thing die. 
And, and, and the reason why is we had one school over the last five, six years that have, have petitioned to do this. Um, there's not enough numbers. I, I think there's a lot of work involved in this and just gathering this data. And, and the reality here is, is that just this is my personal belief. And I think Kate hit on this. I don't think schools are going to want kids to come to their school and play for them if they can't play for a regional or state playoffs or championship or or whatever. I think that's very, very important here. And schools aren't going to be kind of wanting other schools to apply for their school to play. If that becomes the case, then they look like the bad guy, uh, not allowing that kid to come there and play at their school. So at this particular time, I think the data shows that we don't really need to to spend a lot of time on this. And, uh, you know, if this was if we're dealing with 50, 60 kids across the state and two or three or four uh, uh, leagues, uh, that kind of thing, I think then we should jump on it. But at this particular time, you know, I, I think we just let this go. We, we've given it already 15 minutes of, of this meeting. Um, and and we talked about it last meeting as well. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Stallworth. And Mr. Sims, sorry, to, to fully answer your previous question, are the 1A, 2A schools aware of this dialogue? Yes. My my, my answer to that would be they are aware of it from our 1A, 4 league presidents, and also our 2A, Northern and Southern people are, are aware of this. So. And I would second what Rollins just presented. All right, yeah, the only thing I think we'd need uh, – Ms. Watts, is if there was a, a motion to direct staff to do a survey, if there's not, then we we would end this co-op uh, right here. And then if some school wants to, again, write up a regulation proposal for change in the future, it could, it could be done. But this committee would be done with it at this point, then. Any is direction? Is there a motion to move forward? I, I made that motion to, to, to yeah. move forward and, and just let this go. So you want that to be a motion, Rollins? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Lotz. Mr. Stallworth, to, to clarify, your motion is to to let this sit and be done, correct? Yes. Not not the survey, to be done. Not the survey, no okay. survey, none of that. Just, just let this go and let's see if the superintendents bring it back up. Okay, thank you. I'll second his motion. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All the opposed? Okay. So, okay. we will not see co-op again the next meeting. Um, next is the international students. Um, we do have a school that would really like to see the reg change to allow them to be eligible. Um, right now, they have to meet the residency requirements like all other students. Um, and unfortunately, most of them come over on temporary guardianships, which, of course, does not meet the residency requirement. Um, so is there any appetite to want to look at international students and their eligibility I, I'm a little bit confused a little bit about the whole international aspect here. Um, mm -hmm. I, so, I, we had some kids come over who were kind of international kids and they, they came over and then they became like, uh, I don't know, Laura, you kind of know what, what I'm talking about a little bit about the uh, kids from Sudan, but I think they tried to come in as international students at one time and then they couldn't. So then they came in as, as uh, I, I can't even remember, there was three or four different ways they ended up trying to get over here and then they finally became CIT kids. But um, I, I, I'm a little perplexed on this because it seems like our data shows us that when international kids come over, they come over because they've been recruited. Is that true or not? 
Um, I can say with certainty that it was definitely true for two students this year. Um, they were not given eligibility. Uh, it it does leave that door open, um, especially at the private schools. Um, I can so say it's one not, of those. not the case at our school. I think that's the hardest decision we have to make is because we know there are certain schools that it's not. But if we say yes, we open it up to too many that that is the case. Yes. So and right now, so right now it's all or none. Any international kid comes over, they cannot participate at, at the varsity level or participate at all. So the reg was changed that they wouldn't, they can participate at all. If and they that, don't meet the residency requirements. Okay. Okay. Can you explain that really quick, Lori? What do you mean by that? Just, just for clarity, the, the regulate the residency requirements and what a situation would look like that makes an international kid meet those requirements. Okay. So the residency requirements state that you um, must be living in the zone of attendance of your school. You must be living, if you're not with both biological parents, you must be living with the parent that has at least primary physical custody. Uh, the residency rule, if you are on a residential affidavit, so your family is staying in somebody else's home, um, or temporary guardianship, those do not meet the residency requirements unless there's a verifiable hardship. And so when it comes to our international kids, which are on um, F1 visas, um, oftentimes they're referred to I-20, referred to as I-20 students, uh, but the F-1 visa, they're generally here for school. Um, it's quite an extensive process that they have to go through and they have to be accepted at a school before it's fully approved. Um, and so if a kid so goes through that and a family goes through that extensive approval process, we're asking them to provide additional information? Yeah, so that uh, that was talking about the approval process to get the F-1 visa. That's mm -hmm. given out by Homeland Security. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, but usually the case is once they get here, they're staying with a host family. Yes. They're not staying with um, their legal guardian. Okay. And so if they don't have a hardship, and in most cases there really isn't because they're coming here for education, um, they wouldn't meet the heart, the, the residency requirements to become eligible. Okay. And sometimes it's a host family, but it's their relative, if that makes Correct. sense. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, some of them come. And then yeah. we, have, we have kids, like I don't, I don't know if it matters on when they participate in sports, right? We've had some kids that didn't, haven't done anything since, you know, they started here as a freshman, haven't done anything. And then their senior year, like, oh, I'd like to try swim. And swim's a sport where if you're sub varsity, you know, your, your scoring doesn't count, you know, but you can still participate kind of thing. So I don't know, it just gets a little bit, there's some, there's some variance to the issues. Does that make sense? Yes. And when I say the residency rule re applies to them, it also, the part, if they're in, staying in that same home, they're with their host family for 180 school days, attending the same school, they're eligible after 180 school days. Okay, copy. Thank you. Yeah. Lori, I feel, and this will kind of be our stance when it comes to the transfer rule our first time enrollment you know we're where we're at for a reason and i know we have new people in, in new positions um but there's there's reasons why we are where we are and to to go back and just clean the slate and change it i don't think is in our best interest because we're going to have to revisit all those same issues again someone creating their own basketball team, you know, from with the, you know, a bunch of kids from overseas. Um, and so, you know, high school sports isn't the only opportunity to participate in sports. 
you know, you could have kids, a foreign exchange student come over and participate in, in all sports and city leagues and youth sports outside of school. Or you can get creative and you can have these students be a part of your um, programs and, you know, they can be a part of the team and practice and, and do those things and, and get that social interaction and, and also be able to, to play the sport and practice and, and get an opportunity to participate. However, you know, you can't play in any games. Um, so we're still providing that opportunity within the school. If what I'm saying is accurate, you know, yeah. a school can say, you met all the clearance um, protocols and you can be on our varsity football team and you can practice and you can go stand on the sideline. You just can't check into the game. You are correct, Mr. Sims. We do allow that if the school and coach are okay with the kid practicing and traveling as a team manager, um, that is allowed. I just want to say that I'm in support of what we currently have in place. I think our international students should be treated like any other residential move. If you move from one state to the other, if you move from one zone to the other, whatever the case may be, um, you have to meet those same requirements. So I, I'm in support of what we currently have. I don't I don't see a need to change that regulation. Is there anybody that feels there's we should change it for them? Okay. All right, then we will go on to the next item, um, 6C, uh, definition of teams. Hey, Lori, do we need to make a motion? Do we need to go the, to vote since we did that for the co-op? Um, we can if we want to. Uh, if there's no motion, it just dies. Okay. There just, wouldn't, it wouldn't come back. So. Just want to make sure everybody understands the process, though. Yeah. Is, is anybody interested in making a motion on that, the international students? I motion to keep the regulation regarding international students as is um, and table any further discussion regarding changing it. I'll second that motion. Second. I third it. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So on to definition of a team. Uh, this request, I believe Ms. Sloan um, came from you. And this is, we get, I know the Board of Control talks about what defines a team especially when you come to the individual sports. And so Mr. Nelson and I sat down and we kind of looked at the numbers. Most of these numbers are the numbers that you have to have the minimum number of students to be eligible for the academic state team award. Um, with the exceptions of wrestling, um, swimming and track. Um, Mr. Nelson, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you to kind of go through these. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Lotz. So committee, I wanna make sure look at this definition of a team can be used for anything we want to do it, whether it be for state academic team championships, for membership purposes, keeping membership, potentially future regulation change of losing full status membership. I don't wanna get into the weeds on that. I think the very basic of this today is just to define a team and whether we place this as a new regulation within the membership area. I'm not sure we need to do that at this point, although it could be carried into that. Most importantly, I think, is that maybe this goes into the front end of the handbook and our NACs, and when it has definition section, we put team in there and we include this in there. I think that allows the NIA the opportunity to use it however it wants in whatever capacity it wants or whatever matter it wants. So to keep it simple, to try and define a team, that's what I think the goal is for today. So here's what we have. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through them sport by sport and hopefully roll through it fairly quickly for you. So cross country is five, and that's because the NFHS rulebook requires for a team to score in competition, 
you need to have five finishers. Now, there is an exception for the class 1A and 2A we have in Nevada, and that is a class 1A, 2A program may only need four athletes across the finish line to get a team score. But that may end up changing, and I don't want to do something that's not within the actual regulation. Uh, I'm sorry, within the uh, sport hand, uh, sport rulebook from the NFHS. So that's why I left it as five. Now, it doesn't mean a team can't still have individuals and compete in cross country, right? You, I mean, you have individual scores. We don't have full teams. That happens in all of our individual-based sports. But in order to have a team defined, five is the number. Uh, football is 11, obviously, for everything but 1A. That's eight. Golf is four. That's our rules for both boys and girls. You need four scores. And again, in a golf tournament, it doesn't mean a team, a school, can't offer a boys and or a girls program in the spring or fall, respectfully. It just means for other purposes that the NI might use it for, four is the number for golf. Uh, soccer is 11, number on a field. Tennis is six. We do offer nine playing spots between three singles of players and three doubles teams. But we actually do have in our tennis reference manual the definition of a team being six in order to be able to field a team I'm for frozen. a match. So six is the number for tennis. Uh, volleyball, self-evident, six on the court. Basketball, five on the court. Bowling, four scores. Five football, seven on the field. Skiing, uh, Tahoe Basin in Northern Region, four is the number for a team score. So wrestling is the one that's a little bit arbitrary and capricious because there is not a requirement, a minimum requirement for number of participants to score team points in wrestling for a invitational, dual meet, region championship meet, state championship meet. Uh, the number four that we came up with between Ms. Lotz and myself was because that, in, historically, if a team has usually three or fewer, they really, even if those three individuals each win their respective weight classes and contribute points towards the state title, I've never seen a team win it with three. However, four, we have even recently, uh, a couple years ago, we've seen a couple teams with four that have won state titles at individual weight classes and had been really close to winning a state team title. So four is a little bit arbitrary and depreciate for wrestling, but it seems to make the most sense. Uh, baseball, softball obviously makes sense with nine on the field. Swimming and diving and track and field. So to, to go back to those two sports. For our academic championships in the past, we used to have the number for swimming be seven and for track and field be seven as well. And that was based on um, half the number of individual events. So we have, you know, track and field, we have 18 events. Uh, swimming and we have 12 events with, with relays and all that. We, we usually did, we did half the number of individual offered events per track and field, per swimming and diving. Again, that was arbitrary and capricious to use those words again. What we did was define it as four for those two sports, because if you have a relay team somewhere in the meet, you've clearly demonstrated that you have a team <laughs> participating within the meet structure for swimming and diving track and field. So again, that, that's my uh, recommendation for swimming and diving track and field as before. With that, Ms. Lotz, I'll open up to, to questions. Hey, Donnie, let me just pipe in here why you made mention that I brought this up at a board meeting. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the whole gist of this when we first started the conversation was because of new membership. Right. We had schools come in and say, yeah, I got a boys team. I got a girls team. And then, yeah, I have uh, one cross country male, one cross country female. And I think we as an association, we need to tighten it up, especially when we're letting new schools have full membership. And that was the whole purpose of, hey, we need to sit down and we need to define the, the definition of team. I know that I met with my team yesterday and uh, I'll turn it over to them. Kate, you can pipe in any, any time here. Let me just say this, that I think we can't just say cross country five, golf five. It has to be per gender because I could see somebody taking this information and go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I got two boys and three girls, that's five. And I think we need to be specific. So again, I want the group to understand that um, this started by the new membership and, and, and schools coming, coming forward. So Kate, Tim, you want to add? I'll let Tim talk about it. Oh, thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that we need to identify these, Donnie. I, I agree 100%. Um, I am a big believer in 50% plus one. Um, and I think that's where you were with the track and uh, swimming prior um, wrestling specifically. I, I think that's 50% uh, of the weight classes plus one has always been my, just my, where I've at fallen. But I, I, I like the rationale for all of this uh, because I do remember when Western track 
nearly won a state title and they had those four kids that could they relayed it out they did all the relays and man they almost won it so i like the definition there of um with a team because if we call it a relay team we basically stated you have a team so i'm i'm good with that my biggest concern and i addressed this with miss sloan yesterday and kate as well is i really want those to be gender specific uh columns and and in the sense that I, and I'm, I'm concerned about that, is that they start adding, oh, I have three boys and two girls. We got five. We have a team. But I think that that lends itself to um, our own regulation in the sense that you've set these numbers down. Uh, Kate, um, we talked yesterday at length. Um, we didn't even, I don't think we even discussed the numbers. We were we were fine with the numbers. I think we we said these numbers were great. We just wanted to make sure it was uh, gendered out. And I think that's that was our only concern that I remember from yesterday. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kate. Yeah, the only other thing I think we talked about was like having it separated from your team sports and your individual sports. I don't know if that would just for the looks of it to make it a little bit easier, but I, I don't know if that's super important either, but that was just something we and, brought and up. Donnie, I want to dovetail with Kate. I think by putting it where you want to put it in the definitions, I think that takes that problem right out of our out of out of there. It would just literally be delineated out. So I think we'll be in good shape. Never thought about putting it in the definitions area. That's there's no need to write a regulation. We just write the definition. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Goya, and, and Ms. Sloan. Thank you for that. Um, I, I want to apologize a little bit because I inherently assumed that by putting cross country, it meant that right when a school needs to satisfy the fall requirement, they'd have to have boys cross country and girls cross country if those are the only sports they're going to offer. Um, that that was it implied to be boys cross country and girls cross country separately. Football, boys soccer, girls soccer, et cetera, down the board. So in, in the definitions, if that's what we do, choose to put this, and we'll finalize the numbers here in a second. Uh, absolutely, yes. It'll be boys cross country, girls cross country, boys tennis, girls tennis, et cetera, across the board by, by gender. Because, again, that, that's the whole point of this, as you mentioned. It's about membership. We don't need to put it there. We can put it somewhere where we can use it however we want to in developing the, the membership regulations, new member regulations down the road. Um, so, but I think that would take care of it. So if that's okay, let's, let's just do If it's okay, let's, let's review it real quick here. So boys cross country, girls cross country, each five. Is that, is that, is that the number we're okay with? Okay. But if say something otherwise, uh, football, uh, certainly we do need to define 11 and eight because we do have different levels and we care. Certainly I don't, I don't, even though we could say 1A and 2A schools, or sorry, 1A schools, you need to have 11. I, I do want to define that differently because they truly are different aspects. And we already know about programs and dropping kids. And I, I want to make sure we keep a football 11 and 8. I, I think we can still do that within the definitions just fine. Uh, golf, boys and girls golf, each separate and apart from each other, uh, four. Is it, everybody okay with that number? Okay. Uh, soccer, boys, girls, soccer, separate and apart from each other, uh, defined as 11. Are you good with that? Okay. Pipe in, pipe in if you're not. Um, tennis, boys, girls, tennis, separate and apart from each other, six each. Okay. Uh, volleyball, boys and girls volleyball, six. Uh, basketball, boys, girls, basketball. Now, Grant, I, I'm going to speak really clearly. If a team only has five players, they're probably not going to last during the season, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's some, somebody's going to foul out. Somebody's going to have an injury, an issue, and they're going to. But we already know we already have processes in place if a team loses a sport during the season for participation numbers, how that's held against them, right? For member for rate for realignment purposes down the road. So I don't think we need to worry about that. I think this number makes sense just straight into a definition. Uh bowling, boys, girls bowling at four. Good. Okay. Fly football is a is a girls based sport, but we just call it fly football. So that's seven. Uh skiing, boys and girls skiing separate apart from each other four. So wrestling, Tim, this one goes back to you. You had, I, I had put down four, and again, that was an arbitrary number. You had mentioned the possibility we have 14 weight classes in wrestling. You had mentioned possibly about how we used to do it for track and field and swimming and diving. 50% of the offerings plus one. For wrestling, that would be eight. Um, I, I don't know that we need to have eight, but is there, is there, is there an appetite to do something besides four for wrestling? You know what, Donnie, I liked your I liked your explanation of why four. Um, and I think back when we this made me think back to when we did the running clock for basketball. Grant and I poured through the records to find what was the largest comeback ever. And that's when we settled on when we came back and we said we liked yeah. 35 because that was the largest comeback we'd ever seen was like 33. So nobody had ever come back from 35. So I like the adverse of that where you say, you know, we've had a team with four and they almost won a state title. I think 
the minimum number to win the state title is a great way to look at that. And I'm I'm on board with the four. I, I've actually I I just crossed mine out on my notes and said no four, and I haven't circled. So I'm really good with four. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. And I, I, I'm not good at four. You're not. <laughs> I'm okay. sorry, Tim. I I mean, I I personally think that a half of the team plus one really defines a team. Now, if you would have told me that. Oh, I have seen four track guys almost win a state championship, but they didn't. If you'd have told me they did win, I would say, oh, okay, Th that makes a little bit of sense. Almost winning is not. But what I don't want to happen is, is that the swimming and diving and track and field, that number of four people only those schools that have been coming to us about um, joining our association and, 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 and trying to fill a team can get four. I don't think they can sustain four, but they can get four, whereas I don't think they can get the seven plus one or eight plus one. And I think we need to, we need to set that standard a little bit higher to me, getting four four swimmers at, at at a school to 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 meet the qualifications and requirements to to get into our association that is just too small. And I I really like the half plus one uh, to really to to really make it um, because I've been on that committee with uh, with these new schools coming in. And of course, they had four swimmers, and they had four track and field runners, and um, uh, I, I, and and of course, the next year they weren't able to keep them, and and so um, we, we really got to make them earn it. And I don't necessarily think they're earning that by by getting just four swimmers and divers out or four track and field guys out. That's just my point. I like the half plus one. Thank you, Mr. Stoll. I, I would counteract that is if this committee has a flavor to change it from four to a, a more defined number, I would I would argue we don't do plus one. Uh, that's not arguing against Tim or, or, or you, Rollins, but just to have the half number, because to me, that's a very simple number. Um, and seven is easier for school to oblige with for wrestling, 14 ways classes. Um, seven is half it's track and field again. Um, 14 individual events, seven is that number we used previously. Same thing, swimming and diving. Half the number of events, not the plus one. I, I think the halfway point to me in the individual base sport where you're contributing points towards a team total, the half is more more than effective for determining the team, in, in my All opinion. All right. Half then would be fine with me. Be okay. All right, Mr. Jackson, uh, I know you, can, you, you evaluated that with us previously. You, you half, half sound good to you, seven, seven, seven for wrestling. I think it's a I mean, great number. I think it makes it simple, makes it clean. Um, I'm I'm fine with that. I was I was good with it before, Donnie, and I, I was good with with the suggestion of four. I'm still good with Rollins' suggestion, and I like the fact that it's a compromise between the fifty percent plus one because I do agree. When we're talking wrestling, fifty percent plus one, then why don't we just say eight? You know, <laughs> so fifty percent makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. Let's finish this up. Then we'll look for a, a motion to do this. Um, Baseball, softball, nine. I don't quite see the arguments of that. Again, at some point, somebody's struggling, and they're just not going to continue with the team if they can't have more and have a few subs available. And then we just mentioned swimming, diving, track and field at seven. So uh, with, with that, Ms. Lotz, I'll direct it back to you if you want to look for, for a motion to, to these numbers as um, presented, and then also with the recommendation from, from my desk that we work to put this into the definitions at the front of the handbook. So as Mr. Nelson said, we're looking for a motion um, to make, approve the numbers. Oh, go ahead. I'll go ahead and make that uh, that motion to approve the numbers as stated by Donnie with those recommendations going to uh, be in the front of the, uh, the handbook and used by the NIAA with regards to all the issues related to uh, the definition of a team in the NIAA. I'll second that motion. 
Okay, is there any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? So next we'll go on to item 6D, um, definition of a hardship. Um, we have heard public comment, um, both this committee and at the Board of Control, uh, that there is some public interest to change the definition. And I just wanted to see if this is this committee, do we wanna change the definition at all or just leave it as is? Um, I know that my district has been dealing with this um, uh, for a while now in terms of um, this definition is just so bland that um, it, it's not specific enough, I think. And um, I know that we've dealt with a couple of very, very um, committed parents with regards to um, emotional and social uh, stress and, 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 and issues that they feel um, have been designated as hardships um, and so forth. And uh, uh, we've heard a lot about that in, in, in our uh, in our district and, and, and the use of uh, that particular situation as a as a hardship. Um, uh, with with documentation from doctors and and all of those types of things, and I think we need to 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 strengthen this up a little bit. Um, be, you know, I I don't know how to politically correctly say it, but um, I think the 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 well being of a student is is a priority. I don't think the well being of a student is necessarily always. Um, connected with athletic participation as it should, you know, that's what they're trying to make it be is we're talking about the definition and the separation between the environment in which the kid is going to school in and then an additional environment that the school, that the student chooses to participate in in an extracurricular situation here. So, I, I don't know. It's 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 been a it's been a real tough one, but um, I, I don't know. I do think that um, Lori, we did get some request. I believe that uh, talked specifically about the addition of the social and emotional aspect as a possible hardship. Do you still have any of that information? Um, I know that there was a, a proposed addition to our definition that was submitted, um, I believe. I, I believe it was submitted to the Board of Control as public comment, so we would oh. still have that. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, I think I thought that was interesting to kind of take a look at that, that somebody took took the time to add an addition, an amendment, I guess, to the term hardships to at least look at um, look at that aspect. And again, maybe in this definition that we have um, with regards to the NAC that we maybe put some things down there or, or have something listed with regards to um, how we look at social and emotional and, and, and other issues that are more related to the academic setting and the um, and the school setting that is aside from the athletic participation and extracurricular activities of the NIAA. Lori, I have some of that language from our last meeting. Oh, good. Uh, okay. So I'll just read just so that you hear the recommendation that was from that public comment. Um, basically says to define an unusual circumstance may include any circumstance that leads to emotional distress is determined by a physician or mental health care professional licensed within the state of Nevada as the impetuous for the student to change schools and is documented as such by the written testimony of that professional. So just on my side of things, when I'm looking at that, my issue is that school 
athletics, activities are all separate entities and aspects of a student's life. Mm -hmm. If I go to a doctor and I say, you know, all these things are going on and that doctor writes that there are some concerns with the student's mental health, it's difficult for us to know in that conversation because we don't have that conversation. We don't know what that conversation has had with that medical professional. If that correlation to that student's mental health is directly tied to the school that they're going to, or is it the athletics or, you know, it's very difficult for us when we're seeing those letters to know exactly what that tie is. And to say, if you get a letter that says that you have emotional distress, you're good to go. And there's no conversation right. we can have because it's in the regulation. I worry about that because that just leads to us not being able to have any sort of collecting of other pieces of information outside of just a letter that says it means it. Um, so I just worry about that. I don't, I don't know that defining it that specifically is beneficial to what we're doing. Um, and I can just speak also on the side of I I'm on other panels where kids are and their parents are describing hardships. And that panel has very specifically said what constitutes as a hardship as far as X, Y, and Z. And I can tell you with certainty, every single appeal has one of those three buzzwords that are in the definition in it whether or not there's anything to support it. So I just worry giving the definition of exactly what you need to say is going to create a whole bunch of situations that muddle the kids that are actually going through a hardship, if that makes sense. And and again, I think that because athletics is a, is, is a privilege, so to speak, but also disconnected a little bit with regards to the enrollment the movement of a kid, uh, moving a kid out of a um, uh, uh, academic uh, environment and moving him to uh, an, another academic environment is definitely something that school districts should 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 definitely be doing. Um, but when you start adding athletic participation on those types of movements, um, we already have rules for a kid that changes school. So if a kid is changing schools for a social and emotional issue based on what's going on, then whatever the rules that apply to that kid moving from one school to another uh, should should uh, should dictate where that kid should be playing. Remember the the major protest in this particular situation that came to us, the kid was never denied the ability to play a sport at the school they went to. They were denied the right to play varsity sports, and that's what stemmed this whole movement uh, up here in the North. Uh, the NIAA uh, had given the kid the opportunity to play at another school based on their predicament and their situation. I think the kid was only a sophomore, and um, he was allowed to go ahead and play lower levels at this other school based on um, his issue. And I don't think he was uh, given the hardship to even play the lower levels. He was just given the lower levels to 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 play at. And uh, as a sophomore, he wanted the father wanted this kid to play varsity for whatever reason. So, again, we didn't stop a kid from playing. We just stopped the kid from playing a varsity because he was he didn't. He didn't meet the requirement athletically to participate at the varsity level. And dad thought that he should based on the hardship. So, um, again, in our situation that I'm explaining, uh, the kid was allowed to play. And I think a hardship, uh, when we allow a kid to play and there's a hardship because they're not satisfied with the level that they're playing, uh, I have a problem with that. And so... That's where we're at with this. If, if you guys think this is fine, and remember, I think the NIAA office deals with hardships more than we do, right, Pam? Would you would you agree with that? Do you deal with hardships from Clark County? You guys deal with hardships too as well. And have you guys in, in Clark County going from one Clark County public school to another? I mean, what's the percentage of the hardships do you guys really give? Well, well, I hey, can tell you really quick, Kate, let me let me step in and then I'm gonna let you answer his second part. 
I believe that the way that the regulation is written is fine, and I believe it has to be written in this manner, and it can't be specific to, like Kate said, she deals with hardships in a, with a completely different department because people are looking for buzzwords. People are contacting me, Tim, X, Kate, all the time. What, what do I have to tell these parents to put in this letter so the kid's eligible? We can't give that information. <laughs> and you can't be specific and say, hey, listen, if you put in their emotional distress or this and that and guarantee, we can't put that in there because every case, every situation is different. So, so I'm just going to say, I like the way it's written. I think it has to be vague in a sense, the manner in which it is. It we And every eligibility determination is based on the evidence, the documentation, the merit of everything. And, and like I said earlier, every situation is different. But Kate, you can explain about our transfers because Kate deals with hundreds of them. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say a vast majority of mine have a hardship attached, whether it be because they're living in a, like on a residential affidavit, shared housing situation, they are living with temporary guardians or they're leaving like a magnet program or a COSA. So I'm dealing a lot of my transfers with hardships and and I do get that phone call a lot like what else do you need from me? You ask for more support. I got a letter from the parent. What do they need to prove their hardship? And I say, well, take a look at their hardship. They're claiming X, Y, and Z. Provide documentation to support that. And so defining this further, I agree with Pam, gives that blueprint where they're just like, okay, well, if I just say X, Y, and Z, I don't have to worry about this. Versus having those authentic conversations as we should with our parents our, as athletic administrators at the school level, say, hey, what's going on? This is my situation. X, Y, and Z happened. Okay, do you have any documentation that can support you know, you were evicted or this, that, and the next. And then when they collect that, I can tell 90% of the time when something's authentic and when it's not, because I see the dates and the times and the things that they're able to collect. And 90% of the time, again, they don't argue against that because they are in this situation. They're like, yeah, I have all this. This is what happened to me. The ones where they call and they're like, they don't have anything else. They don't have anything else. That's where I start to wonder, is this is this a story to, to circumvent our eligibility regulations so that they can get their kid eligible? When they don't have things to support their hardship, that's where we have concern. And that's where I just don't necessarily believe everything that is being told. So defining this further is just going to give that blueprint for those stories to have teeth versus keeping it as is and having them just tell their story and provide evidence to support the story because that's all that a hardship really is. And if they can do that, they get the eligibility. So that's my side. And and I know too, Rollins, that in your situations, just as Kate, and I know it's not whenever these hardships are determined in the hardcore court cases, I know it's just not your office. I know it's just not Kate and Kate elaborates with all of us in here, but I know she collaborates with Lori. So there, there's that collaboration that takes place and People are not going to be happy. They're not happy all the time No. in regards to this. But I'm going to tell you, like in your situation, had the parent not been upset that little Johnny got some varsity, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We sure, we sure wouldn't. You're exactly, you're exactly right, Pam. You know? and, I, and I agree with both of you 100%. In fact, um, based on the situation that's happening over at Minogue in our district right now, um, the reality is, is that um, my office has been working with our legal office with regards to reviewing the last eight years of our hardships that we have dealt with in our district, specifically in my office. And basically, I can tell you that only um, of the 21 cases, only 15 percent of those cases were hardships that were actually approved by our office out of the 20. 20 something uh, hardship cases that we dealt with. And we had to go back with legal and go over every single one of those and determine why we did give them a hardship based on why we did not give them the hardship. And I think the major thing on this hardship is number two, though, of the NAC is, is not related to participation by the people in sanctioned sports. That should be highlighted and be bold because what our district has said was, from a legal standpoint, the kid may have a hardship, but they cannot participate in the sanctioned sport based on the NIAA rule. 
So just because a kid's hardship is approved based on what the information the parents are giving us, it still gives us the opportunity to say, hey, they still can't participate in sports. And that's what our legal team has done in terms of supporting our office is, is that we have a definition of what the NIAA says is a hardship. It's up to us to determine that. Is that hardship, can we grant that transfer to a kid? Yes, we can. Do we have to give that kid the ability to play sports? No, we do not. A couple of comments. Oops, sorry, go ahead, Rollins. No, and that's how our district and, and legal has looked at that when we dealt with individual cases here where we have denied the hardship, kid didn't transfer, or there's cases where we have given the kid the hardship to transfer, but they couldn't play sports. Um, so we've kind of done a, and we've kind of done that a little bit uh, as well. Couple comments. Uh it's just I'm hearing multiple uh, people, so excuse me if I jump around a little bit because I'm going to address a few things that just came to my mind. First of all, I think that whatever discussion we end up having on the one-time transfer rule is going to affect this. So any sort of progress we make on the hardship definition may be for not if the one-time transfer discussion leads to a certain place. Um, secondly, uh, I think, you know, we're all in education and we all undoubtedly in some form in, in, in administration too in the schools and we all have policies and handbooks and policies are written vaguely on purpose, right? One example I can think of in my case is we have a quitting policy in our athletic department because we want to prohibit kids from joining sports and then quitting. And so, but we write our quitting policy purposely vague and to Kate's point, because Every circumstance is different. Every case is different. And so I want to have a conversation with that kid about why they're quitting. And sometimes the kid is quitting for not very good reasons. And so we're going to hold the kid to the fire on that. In our case, it's usually some sort of period in which they're held out for the next sport. Um, but that's not always the case, right? Sometimes it's a legitimate thing that it's like, yeah, this, this kid shouldn't be punished for what's happening to them. And so we're not going to uphold the quitting policy for that kid. And so I think there's a bit of vagueness to policies on purpose. It's the nature of policies and you can't policy out every circumstance that exists. Um, it's impossible. A couple areas in the current definition where I think um, catch a few people or maybe just provide a little bit of area for um, discussion are the words normal in number one and the words related in number two. I think there's some room to talk about what do we what do we talk about the normal control of a, of a pupil, right? What is normal in regards to the control of that? Um, and then related to participation, how are we talking about being related to? Is it is it related to in the regards to them being able to play the next year in that sport? Is it related as in did the situation that's constituting a hardship to this family happen inside of that sport they were playing? How are we how are we defining related in regards to the in regards to uh, number two? Um, and then lastly, what I would say is, I, and this is dovetailing off of what Rollins just said, though, I think it's a it's a, an important distinction to make. And, and I'm going to try to follow this line of thought. Whether or not the family has a hardship is not the issue. What we are trying to decide is or what the NIAA and in my case, Lori is trying to decide here is. Does that hardship constitute a waiver of ineligibility? We can grant that every family that comes across our 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 plate has a hardship. It's out of their control in their in their sense. It's re, it's not related to their playing this uh, the sanctioned sport. They full on believe that, and we could say, yeah, that that is a hardship. However, it's a hardship that doesn't constitute a waiver of ineligibility. It's um, now. I think there is some trouble you can get into with that language. So I'm not saying that's the right answer. I'm just saying, I think that's kind of, again, do dovetailing off of what Rollins was saying. That's the line of thought that, you know, is sometimes um, had. So. I agree with you on that last point specifically, the rest of it too. But I think that's the key. 
Um, and that's the conversation. And what I have to defend a lot in level two is, and I know Lori does too, is there may be a hardship that exists, but is that hardship what made it necessary for you to have to go to this new school? And, and yes, it's not to find out in there, but that 100%. And, and that's the governing body's job. It's to, it's to wade through the hardships and figure out which ones are deserving of a waiver of ineligibility and ones that are not. Um, and for me, when I'm talking to my families, especially being an administrator at a private school, um, you know, whether I like it or not, I'm, a, I'm in the customer service business a little bit. And so when I'm talking to my families, I'm not going to be sitting there trying to disagree with them that they had this terrible time at this other school and that this happened to their kid. I, I for the most part, am, am just sympathetic to their plight and try to help them navigate the paperwork. And that's really kind of where I kind of stay Switzerland on most of it, because I'm not trying to tell them that this hardship is going to grant them, uh, grant them eligibility. And I'm not trying to tell them that it won't. I, I kind of, you know, I, I don't feel like it's my place to tell the family that this hardship is bogus, right? It's like they in their heart of hearts feel like whatever has happened to them is legitimately a hardship and they needed to leave the school because of it. And, you know, my thought is, yeah, so let's, let's file the paperwork appropriately and let's let the governing body decide on it. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, sometimes when it comes back, not the way they wanted, it's a conversation I have with them about, you know, well, okay, what do we do moving forward? Right. Okay. You can play JB this year. That's great. We'll get through this year. We'll play JB. He'll have a great time. And then we'll, we'll move past this or, you know, something to that, to that effect. But. So. There's a lot of information we've definitely talked about. Like this has been, and I think everybody probably has their own opinions on all of it. The one thing I hear consistently on a consistent basis isn't anything to do with maybe the definition of the hardship, but who's making the decision of what a hardship is. Um, now, I know that Kate doesn't solely make them on her own. I know she runs them by you guys in the office. Um, and then I know when it gets to the, you know, gets to the NIAA level, I know it's not just Lori, but I think maybe if there were clearer, like this is, this is who is involved in it because majority of the problems I hear, cause a lot of people come to me and it's not, I wouldn't say even at my school, I don't have that many issues, but other schools it's why does one person get to make all of these decisions on what a hardship is? Um, so I don't necessarily think it's the definition because I agree with everybody else. I think it's okay that it's vague. I think it's more about at each level, why is it one person getting to make the decision? Even though, like I said, I know that that's not 100% true. The parents and even sometimes people in the building don't know that. And I think that's fair. You're right. You know, we're having, for the most part, two people, Lori and I and Rollins and his district making a lot of these determinations. And yes, we do consult with one another on a lot of them, but I agree with you in that. I will say just from experience now, having gone to several level twos and knowing how the hearing officer views different hardships. And I think Lori, through her experience too, and anybody that's been in eligibility, you start to understand you know, where our regulations lie on a legal sense and, and what really does hold up at a level two as a hardship. And I know what doesn't. So I think Yes, it is one person, but it is with a collective knowledge of previous level twos and previous determinations that we make these decisions. So, and not that people understand all of that, but just kind of to explain it, you know, on the record, I guess um, it's not just uh, like, it's not subjective, right? I'm not just looking at it like, ah, today I don't feel like that's a hardship. And then tomorrow I, you know, decide something different. We do collaborate and try to, um, you know, get on the same page as far as our definitions and what constitutes that on my end. That's, that's really good to know. I mean, that, I think Tammy's exactly right. I think any kind of ammo that we're equipped with to help families understand how the decision is being made, the better off we are. Because I agree with Tammy that I get those comments all the time. And I'm, and I, and I, of course, like Tammy, I'm like, no, that's not what's happening. But, you know, 
it'd be nice to be like, hey, well, this is kind of how their their decision making goes, right? They look at it through these lenses and, you know, and this is what, you know, it's not just how they're feeling that day, like you said. So was this on here to just see if we wanted to make, like if we wanted to change the definition, that's it, right? Yeah, I just brought it up. Do we want to change this definition? Um, it would, you know, we can bring it back um, to really hammer it out at another one. Uh, but since this has been in the public comment so much, I really just wanted to bring it to this committee and see, is there an appetite to change it? Lori, do you and, have anything to add to the conversation? Yes, I was going to. Um, I definitely, I agree with Kate. We we can't really put the buzzwords in there um, because that's what will come back on all of them. Um, and so I, I agree with you, um, putting out, giving you guys the tools to be able to help families understand how the decisions are made and why they're made that way would help. And that's something that I can, um, put together. I don't know if it would just be a like a memo to schools or if I would have to kind of think about that for a bit, but that's something I can work on in letting the schools know so they can tell parents what the process is. Yeah. And I think for us as a private school too, that trickles right down to our admissions department because, you know, we get, we get families who come in and they, and they ask our admissions people like, Hey, so he plays tennis. Now he played last year, but He's coming in. Can he play this year? And my admissions department doesn't know what to tell him. And and so I've been working on kind of a one sheet in regards to transfer rules, like general transfer rules. Um, but yeah, anything that we can have that kind of allows us to speak eloquently, more eloquently on the process, I think the better. And I can tell you, Sai, um, in our district, we do create, we have a one pager on like general layman's terms for transfer and regulations like that, that we use that I think I'd hope most of our schools have it on their website and it's, it's been useful, I think too. So something maybe statewide would be helpful for those schools that don't have a district doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah. As far as I know, we don't have anything like that. Could there be something added to like a three uh, on, on this uh, NAC that basically states that, um, just because, you know, th there are circumstances where a hardship um, can be approved, but doesn't guarantee athletic particip participation, something along those lines, because a hardship is a hardship is a hardship, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee athletic administra uh, athletic participation, because I have been in those hearings in cases where, you know what, this is a safety issue for the kid. Um, these are some of the things that our district has done in terms of, hey, this is a, uh, a non-safe uh, environment for the student. We're requiring a transfer. We're requiring this kid to go X, Y, and Z. Um, there is a hardship, but no athletic participation with it based on, on, on the NIAA rules and regulations on transferring. I don't know. But I, I do know that our district has given hardships, but the kid has not played. And I think that under this definition here, if the term definition has been established, they should automatically gain athletic eligibility. And I don't like that. Rollins, uh, I'm going to pipe in. If a kid's transfer is based on a true hardship, an established hardship, and what situation have you come across that they were not granted eligibility? Because based on this reg, the kid does have eligibility. Do you have an example? Yeah, we have an example. There was an example of a kid that was uh, was at one school, um, was uh, was was a, a girl stated that he had raped her, and. Um, of course, they did the investigation. All of this stuff went on. During that time, uh, the kid was being uh, threatened by all the girl's friends. Uh, it was really, really ugly, according to the kid and his family. Uh, the school police got involved. Uh, the county police got involved. All these things happened. 
and no one found any evidence of of that um other than the fact that the kid said that you know he was getting pushed in the hallways uh his car was being graffitied all these things that were happening but there was not enough evidence to say it and the district decided to go ahead and even though there was no actual evidence based on the on the report um the kid and family were terrified for their son and so we did give him a hardship to transfer to another school and and uh but we didn't allow him to um play a varsity sport based on the fact that um the the investigation itself didn't come up quote unquote with enough evidence to prove that there was a hardship. But you guys didn't deem the the transfer, the reason for the transfer, which you guys felt was in the best interest of the student. Of the kid. The safety of the kid was the, the, the basis of the transfer. And I don't think we wrote down that it was a hardship transfer. We just wrote down it was a directed transfer by the district with no, no uh, varsity athletic participation, uh, blah, blah, blah. And we sent the kid to another school. Wow. How okay. was the goal? Did he go like on a, because we have different things. Like, I, I don't know how your district is when it comes to public, you know, zoning type school situations, we have different programs, right? Like we have an administrative placement when it's from like our behavior department. Yes. Um, that we consider. So is it something like that? Yeah, like, I think it was more like everybody. that because, because we've also done this, you know, I mean, the key with us is, you know, when you start talking about non-athletes, I mean, you have you have directed transfers for behavioral issues. You have the aggressive kid is the one that's being sent to another school right. and all of that. And that kid, because we don't deal with those kids because they're not participating in sports. So we don't kind of see them in our queue and and deal yeah. with them. But those kind of things are happening district wide all the time. Yeah. So I was just on our end, like we we have that as well, where there might be like a hardship and a student is transferred from another school to another school. And it's called an administrative placement here. Um, and in that we have like a, our, I created, helped create the letter for those students that says, you know, you are being administratively placed for whatever reason that they state. And they may be granted that based on a hardship from this other committee that I'm a part of. But it says right in their letter you will need to file additional documentation and you will be ineligible for 180 school days upon that transfer to your new school. So we tell them right off the bat, like, hey, you want to, you know, you have this hardship, you want to go to this school, you're not zoned for it. We will place you there. We think, okay, there's enough there for you to be able to go, but that doesn't mean you get sports. And then they have to apply, you know, to me for their hardship following this regulation. Yeah. So to me, it almost sounds like if you don't have something in place in the district, there almost needs to be something more specific that they're whatever they're provided, their their placement letter specifies somewhere on there. You will need to apply for athletic eligibility pursuant to NAC, you know, blah, blah, blah. Sure. That's in my opinion, because that's worked in our district. We haven't gotten any pushback from any of those because they know going into it, they're not going to get athletic eligibility unless they prove it on the athletic side. Yes. And I think in our case, I, I think in, 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 in our examples, every kid has been just giving lower level, has just been given lower level eligibility uh, based on all the evidence coming in. And, and so um, ours is an administrative transfer as well. And we don't actually use the term hardship. Um, we don't use the term hardship in it because if we did, then we would basically, just like Pam said, if we use the term hardship and gives it to them, the, based on this rule, we should be given a varsity eligibility. Hey, committee, my, my recommendation would be that we do not, at this time, look to change the definite fit and hardship, leave it as it is, and here's why. Because I, I, all these examples tend to be one-offs, whether it be a mental issue, a physical issue, or some other kind of issue. And if you look at the next agenda item, depending on what we do with a one-time transfer, that might inherently or indirectly solve these one-off issues on a case-by-case -case basis. So with, with that, I don't think we need to change at this point, depending on what happens with the next item, the one-time transfer. Agree. 
Is there anybody that would like to make a motion on this item? I'll make a motion that we do not look now, at this point, do not look to change the definition of hardship as it's defined in the NAC. This is Pam, I'll second. Okay, is there any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to item seven. Lori, real quick. Yes. Can I, can I make a recommendation? We take a five minute break. Uh, sure. Oh, thank you. So it's 1028. We will come back at say 1035. We'll give you seven minutes. Tim, look at you taking charge. Not a kid. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'm going to tell you that, that nature is taking charge. If you understand, I need to go to the restroom. <laughs> All this right. Is all, this is also our <laughs> second meeting of the day. So, yeah. Right? <laughs> Gosh. Got it. <laughs>
Thank you, Lori. Lori, are you there? I am. We are being broadcast, just so you know. I just wanted to um, ask about the, the bench clearing because I thought it was in the packet the first time, but then I don't see it on the agenda. I guess I should have checked that. What? I had it in the packet. It should be 824. Yeah, we've got it, Kate. It's, we're Did coming up on the next. Is it in the next, next chunk there? Okay, I thought it was going to be separate. I see now. Yeah. At the bottom. Okay, perfect. Thanks. I just got it out of order. Okay, so it's 1035. I'm going to go ahead and bring us um, back to order. The next topic is the one-time transfer. And so on page 10 of your packet is some draft language for one. Um, wanted to talk to you guys, does this work? Does it make sense? Um, would it work for our schools? I do want to address our public comment today with stating that um, 2B says that, you know, if a student doesn't um, transfer before the first day of school, they're ineligible. And what we mean is that they can't use the one-time transfer after the first day of school. They'd have to wait. So if they transfer at the semester, they wouldn't be able to use that one-time transfer until the following fall. So can I ask so, for just basically what's the the reasoning behind that? Um, we were taking a look at, so let's say you have a student that, you know, I'm going to pick on football and baseball, plays football, then, you know, is kind of doing the open gyms with the baseball team during the winter and decides, oh, I don't like this coach or I don't want to play with this team, whatever the decision is. It's not fair for them to be able to transfer in the middle of the year and play for a second school in a different sport. Um, we didn't see that as being um, equitable to all the students. Uh, <clears throat> so what Lord. we were, because Kate and I talked about as long as they submit their transfer before the first day of school, um, even if it's for just spring sport only. So it would be a lot of, if we kept that in there, it would be a lot of education for our coaches. You need to make sure your families know this. They have to apply before the first day of school if they want to use the one-time transfer. I think the reason why I bring this up, one, CCSD, our teachers and um, athletic directors don't even come back till three days before school starts. So yeah. that's a huge problem for us. I'm here, but I'm also trying to open up a school. So to try to say, and again, I don't know that we're going to have massive amounts of them, but you think big schools, three different seasons of sports, um, 
we have a lot of kids due to registration issues with CCSD that can't even get registered the first week of school. So again, I know that that's, it's, but these are things we have to look at because it's not the family's fault that, you know, we have COSAs that are granted by our office, which, you know, the old loan variances, but that are granted a week into school. So, you know, I, I get it that it should be in the beginning of the year, but, and I don't know what your, if we can make a different drop dead date, I just don't think first day of school is, would be okay, honestly. And I, I want to piggyback on that as a charter school. Um, we have waiting list and sometimes we have kids right now actually that have enrolled and they've been accepted, but they might not get a seat until October 3rd. And, and they've been on the list since this March or February and they don't get a seat um, until we have a seat that opens. And again, that may not be till October, September, November. So when they get in, they get in, but now they're being penalized. And I think that's just something we need to look at. It's not their fault. They 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 tried. You know, they've done everything. They just are waiting for a seat. So we have to kind yeah, of look at that too. For your incoming freshmen, when they're in that situation, they applied, didn't get in until later. As long as they can show they did apply before school started, but didn't get accepted, given a seat until you know October. We have viewed that as a hardship for freshmen. Okay. What about a what a what about a different sophomore that same same situation? They are at. Sierra Vista, um, and when we ran our lottery in this year in March, they they got in, they've been accepted, but they're on the waiting list, and they're, you know, 76th on the waiting list, and they end up getting in in November. That's something <laughs> we'd want to look at for the, okay. on this. Um, yeah, okay, just want to throw that out there. And Mr. Farmer, we have in this office um, looked at and con considered those in the current transfer rule when students have been accepted, they can't get the seat, and a, a, a charter school um, says to our office, this student now comes here. We, we have granted those knowing the student had intent to go there. Again, so long as they haven't opened their bag of eligibility during that particular season and that particular sport because you can't play two sports in the same season. But yeah, no, our office has had consistently – viewed that as a, as a hardship. Okay. Okay. But we've just, just done that not... for freshmen only. It's okay. for those incoming freshmen or the mm -hmm. kids that move from out of state that apply mm -hmm. and don't get in for a while. Um, okay. When it's their sophomore, junior year, that it changes. And that's where I think we're going to run into it again with CCSD. I know this is probably a CCSD issue. But again, like we have no control over COSAs. We have no control when we get them. But if a kid wants to use that, they get granted a COSA. They want to use their one-time transfer, but their COSA doesn't get granted until two to three weeks into the season. That's not the kid's fault. That's CCSD's central office fault. Yeah, and I think some of this too, and Lori and I look at that or can look at that as like when they're enrolled, right? What their enrollment date is. If their enrollment date is after the first date of school because of one of those reasons and they have the letter that shows when they got in, yeah. I think that yeah. we're able to work through some of that. Like, I think this is more of like a general get this in before the beginning of the year. So you're declaring what sports you're coming out for essentially. Um, But I don't necessarily agree with it either. I'm just trying to give like the explanation of it right like, yeah. there are some issues with it being before school starts too um i'm more of the opinion that i think it should be before the first day of the season um but i i get the pros to both um and i kind of feel season is is better yeah thank you i'll, I'll jump in again Diane nelson so thank you and again uh, mr farmer my, my apologies i was in, on the assumption that we're dialogue you know somebody who had applied before their freshman year and for whatever reason, could even get in for year one and was waiting until year two to go. But they had applied way back when as, as in eighth grade. So, again, Miss Lotz can, can, can have that conversation with you to clarify that, which I think she did. Um, so to uh, to Mr. Goy and to Ms. Habig, right, we, when we've talked about this before and presented a bunch of papers to you, right, in previous meetings, states do different things. Mm -hmm. One is states do before the first day of school. Some states do after 14 days of school, of classroom instruction, and basically three weeks of school with sometimes there's a holiday in there, depending on the school start of Labor Day or something like that. 
Uh, another reg another thing that that uh, state associates have done is exactly what you just said, Tammy, about the first day of the season. That has also happened. So I think certainly this committee can discuss flexibility and how that's written. Um, I think more so than anything, the intent of it is to make sure we don't have a student. Now, granted, a one-time transfer rule could be for athletic reasons, and we wouldn't care. Uh, we wouldn't be able to define that. But it was to make sure that we didn't have a student trying to dodge a, a coach or a team issue uh, at the beginning of a season because something transpired during tryouts or something leading into it. But again, we, we're, those are all different cases. I know they're all individual. So to this committee, I guess, again, if you want to look at first day of school, you want to look at two, three weeks into the school year based on the situation or based on a season transfer, you know, I, I would comment, and this is just a comment, not representing any views, the, the legislature is going to want us to be as free and easy as possible. And so we're, 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 we're kind of trying to, I think, meet the, the guidance that I've heard halfway right. where we don't have the NCAA transfer portal, where we don't have where you can just transfer any point during the season one time or as many times as you want. So let's 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 try and figure out right. Maybe 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 that answer is before the season. Maybe maybe it's three weeks, maybe it's for the first day. Anyway, just for what it's worth. That that that, that guidance is to protect other teams, I think, in my opinion. So I had another uh, question on that first part where it says entering the ninth grade. So we're saying that they can only use it coming in as ninth grade, that they can't like say my I'll use my own child for an example. I'll say my kid comes here with me. He's been playing, he's been golfing at Legacy for two years. Say he wanted to transfer as a junior somewhere else. We're saying that it's only incoming. No, that's the yeah. or. It's or. So that's only for we have it like except as otherwise provided a pupil who attends the school for at least 180 school days. So we took that language okay. from. That, see, I'm, I'm yeah. telling you, I'm trying to learn all this legal jargon. That's why I'm like, I have clarifying questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we put that in okay. there so that it, the older kids, you know, I started as a freshman and they still can use it, but just not in the middle of that, that freshman year. Okay. Can we go back to the season conversation? And I'm trying to understand if we're talking about two different things. So I think part of it is we're talking about not not allowing students to transfer mid-year. And that's why we have the four, at least 180 school days part. But then the transfer application being in before the first day of school, I feel like is a separate conversation and issue. And this is really, I'm trying to understand, and I know, Lori, we talked about this, but I'm, I, I don't really exactly remember the purpose and making sure that they get that in before the beginning of the school year, because my concern is, and again, this is just getting kids to do it, but you know, we have these schools where they're trying to field programs and sometimes we're at spring season and we're trying to save a JV baseball program. And it's like, just get your friends out. And your friend might have been at a different school last year, but he hasn't applied and, and he didn't decide until baseball season that he was even going to try out. So now he is considered a transfer because he's he was somewhere else last year, but didn't get his application in before the school year because he didn't know he was going to go out with his friends for baseball. I don't know. Is, is that making sense? I, I think they're two separate issues and I don't I don't see a, anything that could be an issue with allowing them to at least just have their transfer application by the first day of the season versus the beginning of the year. And then just let me know, Lori, if I missed something, because I kind of forgot. So for me, by the season, there's a part of me that agrees, OK, let's do it, you know, by the first day of the season or, you know, maybe. I don't know, 15 days, 14 days before the first day of the season. Um, the one issue I see is you can have a kid come in and play at three different schools in one school year. So you have a kid lives in the legacy zone, starts at legacy, but had applied to go to Doral, um, but didn't get in until, you know, mid November. So goes over to Doral and tries out for basketball you know, and that's viewed as a hardship because they applied before uh, the school year started and then decides, oh, you know what? I really don't like Doral. You know, maybe I'll go to, you know, try uh, drawing a blank on schools right now. Um, maybe I want the smaller class sizes. So I'll go enroll at Liberty Baptist and use my one time transfer then because I got it in before the first day of the season. But doesn't our stipulation in the beginning, having to be there for 180 school days, take care of that? So, like, I don't think that B, yeah. you know what I Not mean? Not for a freshman. 
Tim, you're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm on mute. I, I just wanted to raise my hand. I wanted to interrupt. You know, I, I think the example you're giving, Lori, is is not a, a rarity. I think it's it's, but it can only happen once. What what I'm hearing is based on what we're starting to go down the path of, is yeah, that I could do that over the course of four years, or I could do it in one year. Um, my concern is um, with the legislature wanting us to address this, what I don't want us to do is write new regulation that's inadvertently more restrictive than what we currently have. Because here's what, I, what I'm saying is this. Currently, right now, we do have students that are doing exactly what we're exactly trying to take away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, yep. we're, we're, we have students that are doing it. We're, we're all okay with that. But now we're inadvertently kind of saying, okay, we're going to open this up. But inadvertently we're kind of restricting it again on a we're, we're almost trying to the example i'm using is we have a tupperware bowl with a lid on it and we're shaking up the dressing but the lid's not sealed and and that's why i think we're, we're letting some stuff slide out that we don't want um i like where we started on this and this is just this is commentary i, I apologize this isn't um but um, Tammy, to your to your question, what I always do is this, and I told this to Kate yesterday, I always read regulations in reverse because what it says one way should be what it says the other direction. Yeah. And if yeah. you read it in reverse, does it say the same thing? And that's where I'm at with this right now. I don't think it says the same thing. And, I, and that's where I want to make sure we get this, we get this nailed down. Um, so I just want to make sure that we don't try to come up with a hundred scenarios for one time one offs that we, we we get lost in the bigger mission here. And I, I agree with Lori. I, I see where the concern is. I, I do where you start out at you start out at legacy, you end up at Doral, and then you play at um Liberty Baptist. But after that, you're done. You've exhausted everything. You're done. But we have that, that happen have, now. And that could happen anyway. So I think yeah. what we need to really address here is what do we want? to allow kids to do and the manner in which we're going to do it. So I think that that's where we really need to start here is what do we want a one-time transfer to mean? What is our definition of a one-time transfer? Right. And that and Kate and I had a great conversation yesterday where we, we bounced off different things um, back and forth. And we do this a lot because Kate and I have two philosophically different ap approaches to things, but at the root, we have the same thing at the end. So I think that might be where I think we should really start on this. Uh, that's just my two cents. And I agree because I think maybe sometimes wording gets in the way. And I know for perfect example, like I was talking to my athletic director and I'm like, hey, what do you think reading this? And he's just trying to, he's like, it makes sense, but it doesn't. And I have questions about this. And I agree. I think it's more of how do we, what do we want it to mean? And then maybe draft the wording from there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what do we want? Yeah. Well, I have that's questions. A, that's a million dollar question. What do we want? Okay, I have a so question. Right? So mm -hmm. I have a question just real quick. And I know this is probably, I don't know what your magnets look like outside of CCSD because, you know, this came out and I had a bunch of people, you know, Hey, we're concerned about this. We're concerned about this. Me again, trying to clarify reading this. Okay. I'm right across the street from Northeast Career Technical Academy, correct? Okay. So as of today, my kids that play here have to be zoned here. But could a kid who's playing over there that lives in Shadow Ridges zone decide he wants to play for Legacy? No, because we still have a residency regulation in place. You have to be within the zone or, I mean, I guess I get what you're saying because of the way it says entering the ninth grade, attending a school outside of the zone, you still have to have, you still have to abide by your district's regulations as far as how you get to a school. But I do understand where you're coming from because like up in Washoe, they still have signature variances. So you could just, if they, if the principal says, yeah, you can come here, you can come here. So. So wait, no. Okay. <laughs> See now, now I am confused <laughs> because you said you still have to follow the residency you have to be able to, if you're not attending that school, right? They're not attending that school. So it says a ninth grade attending a school outside okay. of the zone of attendance. You're not, att they're attending Northeast Career Tech. We have a separate regulation that says if you're at a technical academy, you can participate at your zone of attendance school, right? So they wouldn't fall in this because they're not attending your school. 
So they could not use any kind of one-time transfer. No, no, they they yeah. have to be at the school that they are zoned for because they're not attending the school outside of their zone. They're attending a technical academy, separate type of program. Okay. Basically, they aren't going to appear on your IC, Tammy, so they can't play for you. Yeah. I mean, if, if they Makes didn't go sense. to the tech academy, they don't appear on your IC, they're not yours. Yeah. But this, when you go, when you talk about magnet, this does change if we get rid of like our, the current magnet regulation. So I don't know, Washo, if you, Rollins, if you have regular magnet programs still and not just all signature variances, but a magnet program, if we change that regulation would now fall within like we treat zone variances. But that's, you know, so depending on what we do with this regulation will dictate the other thing. what we do with all of our transfer regulations. And that's why it's important. I think like Tim said, is that we start with what do we want? And once we, once we determine as a group, what we want, then we can move with, do we need to adjust any of this language? Is that being portrayed in what we have written here or do we need to adjust it? So what do you want? <laughs> Back to the question. What do we want? Yeah. So, and I'm going to just give you, uh, I won't mention the center's name who met with in the last session we talked through this and what came out in the language. Um, what I believe the legislature wants in basic terms is that a student, after day one, doesn't matter where they start, after however districts and schools do their own admission for day one, a student starts on day one, wherever that is. After day one, a student can go play sports any other school from that point, one free time. No questions asked. Now, they still have to live with parent, guardian. None of that changes, but they can just free and clear. And and again, we have we have a rule that says you can't play two sports. I'm sorry for two schools in the same sport in the season, so that wouldn't change. So you can't start football at school A. Go, oh, I'm gonna, I'm going to get my one time. I'm going to transfer week number three because I'm not getting any playing time. So I'm going to go play football at school B. And that can't do that. The legislature isn't, isn't advocating for that, but it is saying at any time after after day one, free and clear. Just go play at school C, period. So that's the basis of it. So how do we design around that? If everybody's in agreement, we need to design that as a transfer rule. Then we maybe we start from there. So, so, initial, I, so initial school of entry, Donnie, and then a one-time transfer. So if I got into the DP magnet, doesn't matter. I, I'm there. It's how wherever I start, however I started there, and then I can go one time after that. Correct. That's what the okay. legislature wants. Okay. So is and again, I know I feel like I'm always the one that brings this up. Private and charter. <laughs> like, how do they fall into this? Because like right now, I it's still, we do have kids that like come here and play volleyball, go down there and play basketball, come back here and play softball. So that, right, that won't change because right. they're still allowed to do the sports that aren't offered at their charter at right. their zone four school. So that wouldn't change. So, but they could use it for a, they could use it for basketball and go play at three different schools. No. no. no? Okay. One Wouldn't time, work. essentially, they could potentially do that, but they can't yeah. then transfer again. It's always going to be roster exception after that. No, so but that's I'm, what I'm saying. I'm like at, so I'm at Durango playing football and right. then I'm going to go to Doral and play basketball. And then you're saying, then I'm going to transfer my home school to legacy and play baseball. Right. That's what I just did. I just moved my homeschool to legacy. To legacy. I'm not no I'm no longer I'm no longer going back to Doral for another sport. But yeah, I'm sorry, no longer going back to Durango for another sport. Right. My residential address still lets me play at Doral, but my eligibility is now at legacy. Now at legacy. So it can happen one time, but then right. And that would be your th that would that would be it. You couldn't do it again. You can't go back to Durango and play ever again. You're done. Okay. Unless you sat out and did all the regulation so i like that scenario that was good it was good well, let me let me ask this question are we in support of what the the request by the legislators or do we feel as a board that we should go in a different direction but yet accommodate the one-time transfer i mean i know donnie what you're saying but it, are we as a group in support of that I mean, I, I think it's a huge compromise right now that we're even talking about a one-time transfer. I I can honestly say I am in favor of it. 
um, because I think it's going to get dictated to us regardless. So, I, and I mean, I think we're probably one of the only states left that doesn't have it. Um, and again, I think if we try to put too many rules on the one-time transfer, it just gets back to basically what we are now. So I'm definitely in favor of you can do it one time wherever you want, but then after that, all the rules apply. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I believe we need to define the, like we just talked about, mm -hmm. you know, if I, like Tim said, if I start, if I start my clock at Desert Pines Magnet and I live in Chaparral zone, you know, and then I transfer, I, I, I'm going to make a recommendation for the sake of time that um, I would like a small committee be it could be Tammy, Kate, and Lori get together, and anybody else that is on this panel. If you guys would like to get together, take a look at this, and bring it back to the committee. I don't think we need to to have a spell it all out today because I think this really we need right. to take a look at this because there have been there's been some really good conversation. Can I ask for a if we're going to do that, just a one uh a quick clarification on the first entry and if that's what that means and if that's added into also the one-time transfer or if that's considered the transfer if that makes sense yeah and, and i can answer that one mr frick Th thank you so we, as we've had committee meetings in the past and i've given you a whole bunch of like language and examples from other states and try to convey what again i I don't know what the legislature is going to stand on us. I'm, I'm only trying to guess and get ahead of it. doesn't mean to what Ms. Sloan said that we have to do this. Um, and I don't know that we really want to do it. Maybe we're doing it because we feel like we're going to be forced to do it. Are we really or not? I don't really know. I think so. But uh, speaking for these. So anyway, Sai, back to, your, back to your question. Originally, I had put language in that said, we do not look, the NI does not look at anything with regards to who starts where on day one of their ninth grade year. Districts can do that. They don't want to allow kids to go who live in zone A, they attend school B, or again, we already don't look at charter schools. We already don't look at private schools, right? The students who go there on day one, they are free and clear to go. And so to try and balance that out originally, it was allow public school students to also go wherever they want on day one. The challenge that came with that is public schools didn't quite know okay, what's going to happen to our student population. What about allocations, right? There are all those inherent things that came challenged for public schools. But to the point of your question, what I think the legislature would say is also is let schools and districts figure out how, when, where, and why a student can start on day one. Let the NIA say, we don't care any of that at the state level that our NACs. Day one is day one, period, end of story for the student. And then after day one, no matter how they started or where they started, then a student would get one free B to go wherever they want after that for their athletic eligible. So, so Cy, what I did originally is, is, is say that, but then we took out day one, right? We took out, as member Tim Tim brought up in the board meeting, how do we define first entry? How do we define one-time transfer? To me, they're separate and apart. So that's that's the fundamental question is, are we back to saying the NIA doesn't care about day one? We only care about one-time transfer of a move after the student has established eligibility at some school for their first initials in ninth grade, and then at any point during that high school career, then they can go one time afterwards. My, my recommendation is the NI does not look at day one, period, end of story. We, we ignore it. We leave that to our districts. That's an undue burden on our districts. And it's awful to say that. And I realize that and I can admit that because it's easy for office to go, hey, we don't care. Good luck to our county. Good luck, Washington County, how you deal with day one. But you can. Districts can deal with day one. They don't have to change anything. So then, so then it comes back to the fundamental question is if districts restrict where day one is, we don't care at the NIA level, state level. You can go somewhere else, day two, day three, day four, wherever else after your career to go free move, free and clear, just get out. That that's what that's where we are today. So does the legislature have a dog in the fight in regards to what the district does about that or no? That's a great question. I I, so I honestly I don't think I can answer that question. I, I don't know enough about what may be coming out of starting the next session. I, I just and don't know. Great just question. To be, just to be clear, let me let me re- let me re-say what you just said, make sure I heard you right. So kid, right now the kid lives in the Palo zone but goes to Centennial. What you're saying is that the district should decide whether that should be allowed or not. It's not an NIAA matter. 
Uh, all the NIA cares about in regards to transfers is after that kid starts day one of his ninth grade year. Correct. But with, within the regulation, shouldn't that indicate that? So there's no manipulation of? Well, I think that's why we have that sentence, right? With the uh, attending outside of the zone? Correct. So there's still that stipulation because we do still have currently regulations that say you have to live, if you're in a public school, have to live within the zone. So we're saying if we, if we go in this direction, we keep our regulations that say if you're not within the zone, right now it says you can get nothing higher than JV mm -hmm. for the first 180 school days. If we kept that and we kept this language about entering the ninth grade school, you can use your one-time transfer for full. That keeps us in line when it comes to the attendance piece and having you can't just go play at Centennial because you have to number one be attending the school and be zoned for the school unless you want to use this to get your full eligibility. But the, I think the question then becomes, and I think this is where Cy is going with this, the school district has allowed you to attend that school on some method, some basis. Yep. Does your eligibility go with you initially on that? And is that going to be counted as your one-time transfer or is that transfer going to, that one-time transfer still there? In other words, okay. I start, I live in Palo, I go to Centennial on a COSA. a COSA. Does that have to count as my first time transfer or is that my initial school of entry? So not, the based, legislature... not based on your, your initial example of right. getting in on the magnet. Sorry, Donnie, go ahead. No, no sorry, Pam, I didn't mean to trip over you as well. So, so Tim, the legislature, I think, I think, I don't want to say believe, I think would say, no, that is not your one time you still you still get to start free and clear on day one and you get to start free and clear day two that's your that's your one time so there's actually two inherently in a public school system there could be two transfers right yes that's they right. would and, and remember I, I think that and that's key because um for example i'm going to go to a magnet pro or not to a magnet but to a charter school program a charter could be k-12 yeah. and that kid could just matriculate through are we going to now go back and say as a ninth grader we just transferred that's that's where I see this inherently headed in, in the two different ends. So is a, a student who was an eighth grader that had gone, you know, I'm going to use my own child. My own child started at her school in the sixth grade. In the eighth grade, she simply just changed the hallway, moved into the ninth grade. Is she technically then a transfer because she did not go to a residentially zoned school? Well, so the legislature would like us to say, I, I think they would like to say, no, that is no. not that is not a transfer. So wherever you start is where you start, regardless of how you got there. And it's the district's responsibility to establish the protocols for you to get there. But your eligibility goes with you. Correct. Well said. And that's Kelly. why I believe that needs to be specified in the reg. OK, so and, I, and I've heard this mentioned before, but the and, I, and correct me on my and if my thinking is wrong on this. So, OK, we've we've just discussed the possibility of allowing a kid to transfer twice. Because they come into there as a freshman in a school that they're not a zone for. Then at some point, they can still transfer in high school. Then at some point, if they had a legitimate hardship, they could get approved for another transfer. Technically. I, I would answer the question that size, no. No. <laughs> okay, right, I, I guess depending on a hardship definition, you can always apply for it again. But, but, I, but I would think that, that, would be, that would be moot because in your, in your original... <laughs> Not your original enrollment. Your, your first transfer that would be specified in there. You're you're getting this. This is this is your time. You're not going to apply for a hardship. Again. And I think the I think the what what needs to be clearly communicated about that is that we're not permitting you. We're not prohibiting you from changing schools. If you have a legitimate hardship and you can't be at that school because it's unsafe for you, a hundred percent you should leave that school and you should go to a different school. You just can't play varsity sports. For the 180 days. I have a question too. Good With time. our magnet programs, could the one time transfer be used to go back to your homeschool from magnet? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Based on this writing here, yeah. Okay. Okay. I have a question. <laughs> it's good. It's tough stuff. Entry rule. What about 
in our community, we have kids come in and register first time entry into our school district as a sophomore coming from California. His entry, first time entry into our district will be his sophomore year. Does he go to his zone school or can he use the entry rule and go to a school outside of the zone of his residency as a sophomore? <laughs> That's a wonderful a question, question, Rollins. No, That's it a is. wonderful question. Because we yeah. only address ninth grade students going outside of the zone. So that would mean, based on our current regulations, if they're on a signature variance in 10th grade, they don't get the option to use the one-time transfer. They have to go JV because of our current rules that say JV, right? I mean, am yeah. I missing Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying that my, we just moved to Reno. It's October. Um, I'm going to move into the hug zone, but I heard that Reno has a better school for whatever reason. Can I use my first entry into Washoe County School District and go to Reno High School as a first time entry into the district as a sophomore? Technically, unless we state that is for freshmen only, that's my first entry into the district. I should be able to go to Reno High School, living in the hug zone, and be able to play baseball at Reno High. Well, Rollins, I, would, what if, I, would say, I would say, Rollins, you had to use your residency address to register. Therefore, your school of residency would be hug. Therefore, that's your first entry based on residential verification. If you then choose to go to Reno after that, you are now exercising your one-time transfer. That needs to be how it needs to be written then. That's because what you're there. Yeah. That's well, oh, hold on, guys. We're talking about two different things here. Yeah. So in the last meeting, I we kind of when in the discussions, and maybe I'm wrong, it was kind of well, the one-time transfer for incoming freshmen could help you know, be used for them to get full eligibility. And, but now we're discussing a one-time entry, um, which is off topic here. Yeah. So is the committee interested in having both a first entry and a one-time transfer? That was my initial question because that's, it seems like I've always heard them talked about together, but I wasn't sure if that's, they're two separate things or not. Yeah. But currently we have, for, we have initial school of entry for, for full eligibility, if you go to a charter, you go to a private, if you go to your residentially zoned public school. If we institute something about a first entry, that would only be changing those students. And currently we actually have for magnet students too in a public school that are outside of zone. The only thing that would change if we do first entry is zone variant students. So students that are not in a magnet program or any of their those other three options. So that is why instead of instituting a whole first entry regulation, we instead put something here about if you're entering ninth grade outside of your zone, you can be eligible fully by using your one-time entry because we would keep our out of zone regulation that says you only get JV. We'd keep that regulation in place for any further transfers after ninth grade. But if you choose a ninth grade to go there, then you essentially are getting your first entry. But now if you transfer, you drop down to number three, you get the roster exception. You don't get full eligibility. Mm -hmm you transfer after using that for your full eligibility out of zone. If we want to get rid of that, then we'd have to open the floodgates and say, COSA students get full eligibility now. Zone variant, signature variant students get full eligibility now. That would be a true first entry. Everybody else already gets first entry, if that makes sense. Yeah, Kate, you're right on. No, you're exactly right, which is, again, why I think going back to Ms. Sloan and bringing four or five of you together, and I realize this is not that big of a group anyway, but probably bringing it into the NA office to go, let's, let's spend the day and um, be right. Cause we're, we're to, to Ms. Lott's point, I don't want to get off topic the way this is agendized. This is agendized about a one-time transfer. This is not agendized about reverting back to a first entry. So it doesn't mean action needs to be taken on this today, but again, I think finally we've gotten to the point now where everybody stands, understands the, the magnitude of what we're talking about here. And you can see why other States have had an incredibly difficult time trying to put this together, right? There, there are States that are ahead of us. And it took them two years of discussion to try and figure it out. And what it always came back to was to try and, it's easy for me to say, right? Always came back to is try and make it as absolutely simple as possible. If you want to start day one and then go some more day two, that's fine. If you want to continue what, what Kate just said in the scenarios that we have about the magnet programs, 
and then just then go somewhere. But exercise that as your it's just a it's a philosophical thing, right? It's how far do we want to go with this? And and I and I don't know that we know the answer to that. Ryan, I know you've had your hand up, so go ahead. Thank you. And uh, just for my own clarification, going back to what Rollins said, his example of the California kid. So that first entry is kind of based on what what the Washoe County School District does um, for that first entry. And since we no longer have magnet. And we no longer have anything that gets you varsity eligible. Full choice if, only. If you go to a school that's not in your zone. So that kid, if he enrolled in Reno, he would be sub varsity. Um, unless he chose to use his, his transfer immediately. Right. Correct, Ryan. That's how this would be written, is what you just said. Um, what I think. And this, this is it's such a broad statement, right? And that's why we're all trying to grasp what, what, what the meaning truly is of this thing. What I think the legislature is trying to do is, in essence, help the NIA overall, but really almost puts an undue burden, not undue, a burden back on districts because it doesn't want the NIA to say, we deal with how you start wherever you start. We don't care. And so, so to Rollins' point is, if, if Rollins said, hey, some kid moves in as a sophomore from out of state, and they want to go, and they live in the zone A, but they want to go play at zone B, the NIA would go, we're not even going to look at that. This is just a local level. And so if, if Washoe County says that's not a one-time transfer, that's the Washoe County's decision to do that. Now, that opens up a gigantic window of things, but that's where the legislature is. They're, they're, they're trying to say, and I write something that is as minimal as possible at the NIA level. And let the schools and districts deal with day one, however it starts in ninth grade or moving into state as a sophomore or whatever, right? That, that's what that's what I think is trying to happen. But we're okay, we're um, we're trying to figure out how it all goes. Anyway, Lori, go ahead. I, I've said a lot. I'm sorry. So we're really getting off topic yeah, here. I so I just want a quick: is does the committee just want to look at a one-time transfer, or do you want to look at both first entry and one-time transfer? Oh, no, we have to look at both. Huh? I said, don't we have to look at both? Aren't they kind of married? Not the way Kate explained it. The way she explained it, I think, made made sense in regards to how they're the same, but not not the same. I okay. mean, if and again to repeat what Kate said, all of there's there's some cases in existence already where a kid can go to a different school his freshman year. Uh, however, if it's if it's going to be outside of those regulations, they would be exercising their first time transfer or one time transfer. Excuse me. Yeah, and that's that's correct, Mr. Frederick. And so that's why again, if we want to go down that premise, we're not that far away, honestly, from getting this done, in my opinion. But it's still going to require a group to come back and say, okay, well, what's proposed here is not exactly correct, but it's on the right path. But again, that's where we are as of today. I would vote for look at just a one time transfer and not look at first entry and one time transfer. I second that. Would there be appetite? Sorry, Lori. <laughs> uh, just advocating for our admin, making it within the first 180 days of a student's enrollment. So you're not getting super teams developed by juniors and seniors transferring they still have their transfer according to what we're talking about but if we made it within the first 180 days of their enrollment now you might limit or or yeah limit the well i'm going to go here because they're good and it's my senior year and i'm it's kind of like the college athletes chasing the nil uh, and sorry team donnie uh, nelson mr sims i i don't Having that kind of restriction would not fly. I don't believe the legislature. So again, if a student has saved their one-time transfer all the way into their senior year and go, all right, this is my senior year. I want to go win a championship and I want to go play at school X, Y, Z. Legislature says they, that, that student should have the opportunity. Now, again, they're not transferring for athletic reasons. They're transferring for other reasons. But we, we'd be blind to that. It wouldn't matter. So the answer your question is no. I, I don't think that that would not fly. It, um, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of push us through here. Um, so I'm, we're going to go past this discussion. It'll come back at our next meeting on the 23rd for sure. 
Um, the next item, 8A. Um, <laughs> so this is just um, 702, taking out language just to, so it's updated. Um, you know, we don't ask for our schools to mail or fax their, their transfers to us. It's all done through Activate. Um, and then uh, section, subsection two, a pupil must register separately for each sanctioned sport. I, that hasn't been enforced. I don't know that it's necessary. Um, 704, you know, this was... Um, Okay, I got one. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, if we go to 708, this was adding language uh, to stop kids from repeating the eighth grade and taking all ninth grade courses. 710 um, was adjusting the, the age of people who's 19th birthday, if anyone's interested in that. 14. Um, the residency, this was suggested that we take this language out that says what can be submitted because it it really confuses people. Um, so that was just a suggestion. 716 is the transfer rule. And it was, um, the changes made here are kind of reminiscent, if we put in a one-time transfer, um, do we want to apply the roster exception to everybody? Instead of you're ineligible in everything for 180 days, you're only ineligible in the sports that you rostered on in the last 180 days. Um, uh, the subsection two, that was kind of old language that um, about what is a transfer. Um, 720 was the same zone of attendance with a one-time transfer or even we're adding the roster exception. Is that language even needed? Do we need it if a one-time transfer exists? Um, 722, I believe, is the magnet um, regulation. And with a one-time transfer, that could probably be taken out. We probably wouldn't need that regulation anymore. And I apologize for going so fast, but there is one that I want to get discussed. And um, 728 is um, option zone schools. We don't have those anymore. So this regulation is old and, and could go. Um, 734 uh, is homeschool students. And section three is just, it's confusing to families um, and schools. And so it was just removing that one one section, 744 is the <clears throat> attending outside of your your zone. Um, the language in subsection one that's been updated, um, we've never enforced that they have to apply for their eligibility 90 days before <laughs> this, uh, the season. And so we kind of changed that to first official day. And then the pupil must submit an application on a form approved by the, um, it says association in another regulation um, toward the beginning of the NAC, it says executive director. So that was just updating it so that um, it was the same. And that, that form that we use right now is activate. Um, and removing the language that if you used your if you were granted sub varsity eligibility and transferred and did not have a hardship and were denied that you can't appeal it, it's just removing that language. And then lastly, the one I wanted to <clears throat> make sure that we got to today is 824. And this is the bench clearing rule. And so this is one that we wanna really take a look at. Um, it does not address if there is some sort of altercation after a contest is completed. Um, so is that, and I'm, I'm going to ask, is that something we want to pursue? And do we want to, if there's a penalty enforced, um, have any sort of appeal process that it can be appealed? Well, I definitely think we need to address that. So I will open um, this one up for discussion on what we, how we want to move forward with this one. 
Well, and I, Lots, I'm, I apologize to everybody on the committee. I have to leave and write exactly five minutes for, for an appointment. So my apologies. Uh, this is a big one. This uh, Ms. Sloan brought this up to uh, to be an agendized item. And here, in, in my opinion, Pam, you can correct me if I'm wrong. To me, this is really a, a post-game situation where we have a determination of a victory. And then we have a team that says, well, we have nothing to lose. Let, let's go. Let's go find another team and get after them. And we're in already off bench areas or out of play field areas. And right now, it's by our regulations in a post game, we're declaring a double forfeit. That could happen in a handshake line, depending on what happens, right? We're, we're still in the method of the contest. And other states, again, this is just food for thought, other states have actually developed in that scenario an appeals process, which is something that's completely new and different for us, right? This is where I'm talking about a level two to our hearing officer. We're actually talking about possibly a three person panel of administrators or somebody around the area that would engage in hearing an appeal for a post game victory, not necessarily being forfeited out that the result would stay. And maybe there could be other penalties that would come forth if the team that won the game still engaged in something. But if they were determined to be the victims of a, of an attack, so to speak, to revert a victory and not somebody have a bracket just because then that team could be by a panel uh, cleared to continue on in a bracket, continue to have victory. Um, obviously there's all kinds of questions of who is that three person makeup or the five people. What's the time frame of it in a postseason situation? Like, Hey, we just won. We're going to play the next day. How does that happen? I don't have all those answers, but I, I think Ms. Sloan just, uh, like I said, I'm sorry. I've got only a couple of minutes. Is that the intent of you wanting to, part one to review this regulation? Oh, absolutely. You nailed it on the head. And I'm going to tell you, the concern really isn't the individuals in this office or anybody that I've talked to that's, that's on this panel. This concern has come from coaches um, because, hey, what would happen? I'm such and such team. We're in the semis. You know, my kids get upset. They start a battle, on you know, bench clearing, and then the other team, you know, and then both empty out, and then the regulation states you're forfeited. I mean, who initiated it? Yeah, my kids were in the wrong. I just, again, this concern came from coaches because we have seen situations, you know, in the semis that could have potentially ended up in this manner. Uh, Donnie alluded to the timeline. If you have a panel, you know, sometimes you play the next day. You know, football, we're fortunate. We have a week, five sleeps, as we say in this office. But uh, the turnaround time is quick and fast. Um, Kate, you see this all the time now since you do elig uh, eligibility um, for this. For this, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, just real quick, we did see a football game where this occurred this year, where the game was over, squads were leaving, so it was technically bench clearing because everyone was off a bench, but it was just a brawl between both teams initiated by the team that lost the game. And it ended up being a double forfeiture, and the and the team that ended up winning that game was very upset about it because they didn't really have a lot of control in the situation. It just kind of was chaos and it ended up being, you know, a double forfeit. And it wasn't anything in that particular moment, like a, a playoff situation, but it was definitely a uh, food for thought in that moment. So I do think it's important that post game game is over score is set. My opinion would be score stands. Um, we can also, you know, obviously have a, a loss uh, moving forward or maybe not having to, to play that next game for both teams if they're both involved in that sense. Um, but I think that that particular game, that sports should stand. And I definitely agree with an appeal situation. Um, and I almost feel that, and I don't know if we we're talking just appealing postseason situations, I'm sorry, post game situations, but even, you know, there's only two minutes left in a football game and they're losing by a lot and they do this, you know what I mean? Even if the game's not over, but it, the game's, possibly yeah. over that there could be, you know, talk about that outcome. If a, if a game is completely called and done. Um, I know in middle school here, we had, I think three situations where this happened in basketball games, the games were called and we just said score stands at that point game was over and, you know, we let the score stand. So just a, another kind of thought with that. I have a you know, Daddy, we had a situation when I was Ray and I were at Silverado baseball, the, the, the semi game ended up uh, bench clearing and uh, our baseball team was due to play in the finals and Eddie showed up the next day. And I believe you and, and yep. presented Silverado with the trophy. And we did that's correct. We didn't get if to I, play it out. So exactly. If I remember that correctly, it happened in the seventh inning. Yep. It was I, Durango. I, yes. 
I think it, you're, you're I didn't around. want to mention Durango, Tim Jackson. <laughs> That's all right, Miss. Long Sullivan. time ago. I will not forget it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll let you continue on again. I, I look forward to joining everybody, you know, working working through Miss Lots. I, I really apologize. I've got to go thank to you, a doctor's appointment. So thank you, everybody. Well, I believe if we continue to have this conversation again, this is any this isn't something. I think it needs to be a continuous conversation. Um, yeah, we need to do something with this. A couple of comments, just really quick. Not all of it gets solved, but I personally think that the handshaking tradition is something that can be modified, or I just especially in football. The, the emotions are so high. I just don't think it's a great idea for both teams to be that in that close of proximity to each other. It's probably one of the hot, most sensitive touch points when I'm covering a football game is making sure that handshaking line doesn't go south. And we've instituted policies in which, you know, our coaches are not allowed to, excuse me, line up at the end of the player line. They have to disperse within the players because that helps with it. Um, but I wouldn't be opposed to seeing some sort of like back to COVID regulations. Like we're just going to wave to each other. We're not going to go shake hands. Um, I know, you know, I'm not like super sold on that. It's just something that I think about. Um, and then I also think too, there are times in games where, right. There, there are moments of transition. Like it happens a lot in football, but it happens in basketball too, where players are actively coming on and off the court. And it's difficult to tell whether it was bench clearing or just happening in a moment of transition. Um, and so, you know, that that's something I think that needs to be looked at. And then finally, my thought on the double forfeit or the, the forfeiting of the next game, I think there needs to be some discussion about the ramification, these ramifications and the effects that has on the team in, in which they're playing next. Right. It's it's almost a punishment on the team who had nothing to do with the fight. Um, and so. I don't know what the solution there is, but I think that's a topic for discussion as well. I think too, in that situation, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, where we did have that double forfeit, we allowed the two uh, opponents to play. Did we, di did we not do that? So they didn't miss out on a game too, Cy. Si. Awesome. Correct. Yes. Well, it, we're in a, uh, you know, I, I, years ago, I, I know that um, we lost our last game of the season, our senior day, because the game the week before our, the last game of the season, uh, week eight or something back in the day, uh, Sparks was playing a game against somebody else, and there was a fight that broke off, broke out. Both teams forfeited the game, and Sparks had to cancel their game against us, which was our senior night, um, last game of the season, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we were the, you know, their next week's game, and, and our kids, our school lost the game. We lost the gate. We lost everything. I think one thing the district did was is that we got a stipend for like a thousand dollars or something of what we would have lost at the gate for our program and all of that. So that's one of the things because there's really nothing you could do if you have that game scheduled last game of the season. Everyone else is already playing a game. Uh, you know, there, there there's really nothing you can do in terms of. Of, of of finding an opponent for this game and, and and that kind of thing. I think what our district did at that time was basically, you know, send us a check for what the school would have made had they hosted their home game and and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and that's really all you can do. There's really nothing. There, there's really nothing else you can do. Well, and I wanted to add. Sorry, I'm outside because I'm at lunch duty, but. Um, I'm a huge fan of the appeal process because this actually did affect us two years ago and ours wasn't even a bench clearing brawl. It was a girl who went after one specific players, but because they stepped onto the field, it was declared a bench clearing and we didn't get to go on for postseason, even though we were winning the game by like 40 some points. So 
I think adding in the appeal is great for situations like that. All right, so um, I will ask that you guys kind of think about this and how we, if it sounds like everybody's pretty unanimous on adding some appeal language, what they can do to appeal. Um, so if you, I would ask that you think about that for the next meeting and we'll bring this back to try to um, discuss it further. Um, this We're at the two and a half hour mark. So um, we can, <laughs> these can, conversations could probably go all day, but I don't think we want to do that. So when it comes to the one-time transfer and, um, and or first entry, I think we never got the question answered what it is that we want. Um, so I think, think about that, what it is that we want, what would work and bring that to the next meeting. Um, Lori, did the packet uh, for this meeting come attached with the uh, invite the, yes. uh, slides that you showed? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so going forward, um, Paul will be, be able to attend the next meeting. So we will be able to have some of the more difficult questions answered. Um, so I have them written down to bring back. Um, so if everyone's okay, I'm going to move us on to the next agenda item. Um, which is um, future planning. So like I said, um, homework, bring some ideas, what it is, what do we want? Um, bring that back. Uh, bench clearing will come back. Um, think about what an, an appeal process would look like. Um, and adding in for, uh, language about post-game um, incidents. And does anyone else have anything they'd like to see come back? Lori, can we add um, talking about the definition of transfer, if we want to update that at all? And if that, you know, kind of coinciding with our one-time transfer, I think still that word should be looked at um, in our definition. Yeah. Um, and Definitely. I'm going to bring back all of those regulations. I kind of skimmed through them real quickly so we could get to the bench yeah. clearing. I, I wanted honestly, to make sure we got to that. So 702 through all the 700s, essentially, I feel like we can't yeah. really fully dive into adjusting them until we decide what we're doing with the one-time transfer. Because I did, like, I I just drafted, rewrote them all, kind of what I thought they would be if we went in the direction of what we currently have. But I feel like yeah. without having that, it's hard to talk about them until we know that for sure. But I think it's important right. to continue to have them up there so people are comfortable and start reading them to know how they're going to be affected. Um, the other definition that just, and I don't know that we need to talk about it right now, it's not as pressing, but we don't have a definition of affidavit of residency. And I think that's important, number one, because if you just like Google the word, it doesn't really, it doesn't really mean anything. And I think different districts and, um, you know, for public schools have different names for what that really is. And so I think just defining what we're referencing in that regulation would be important at some point. Again, it doesn't need to be the next meeting. It's not pressing, but just a thought to bring up at some point. Yeah, definitely. Anyone else? The only thing I want to, uh, to, to add is the possibility of our language of um, if we are going to take in any kind of movement transfer, leaving schools or whatever, that we try to be consistent and automatically put in lower level eligibility instead of no eligibility. Um, I, I think that you know, punishing a kid and having them sit out 180 days is 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 pretty tough. And uh, uh, granting non-senior uh, students uh, lower level eligibilities is always a good compromise with uh, with that. And and um, sometimes it brings a lot of red tape and a lot of investigating to find out which sports you're going to have to sit out 
180 days and those that they can play on the JV level and you can't play this on the varsity level, those kinds of things. So I just I just think that just needs to be in the discussion and 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 consistent because some rules we have it where they can play lower levels, other rules we have it where they where they can't. Okay. That's all just just a discussion item. Okay. So Lori, in the interim, do you before our next meeting, do you plan to get a small little committee of individuals and talk about the one time transfer? Just yes. do a Zoom call. Yeah. I Kate will be more than happy to represent this office. <laughs> did we decide which one was going to be in person by the way um yes i did want to talk about that too may 1st will be the in-person meeting that's the date that works for majority of the people um if i believe there was one person who couldn't come on the first in person if we will have zoom like this because we have to we do have to stream the meeting um we can get you logged in so you can at least come and attend um virtually so what I'm going to ask uh, those of you that are going to be traveling um, is to contact Ms. Tia Wonder in our office. She's going to need some information from you, um, your legal name as it appears on your ID, your date of birth, um, so that she can book your, your flights to come up. Um, some of you she already has, um, but I think quite a few of you she does not. So if you would contact her and just give her that information, that would be great. And then with that, I will go ahead and adjourn us at 1139. Thanks, everyone.